Okay, members, we'll call the meeting to order and advise those in the public gallery uh, we want to bring them in. Okay, members, so for those uh, seated in the public gallery, they're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. You can also connect to assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available on the gallery <coughs> rules and it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of our meeting. Okay, members, are you aware of any apologies for today's meeting? No. Okay. Agenda item two then is chairperson's business. Um, we met informally with the senior leadership group representing special school principals on Tuesday the 11th of February. The meeting was designed to inform a future education authority briefing on special schools and the special school principals, as members will be aware, raised a number of wide ranging issues in respect of the change in profile and increasing number of pupils in special schools. Uh, the absence of staff continuing professional development, difficulties with staffing, budget formula and the lack of recognition of pupil qualifications. The principles are to provide further information include a, including a paper on area planning and budget challenges and a list of schools which the committee might usefully wish to visit. Members uh, have any uh, comments to raise on that particular matter? <coughs> William, you'd like yeah, to come in on that? Thanks, Chair. I, I think I think all of us collectively were shocked at what we heard. Um, obviously, these people, uh, as well as being educationists, are far and beyond that uh, in terms of the dedication that they have and the passion they have for making sure the, the young people in their care are educated. And I think they need all the help and support they, they can get. I think it would be, obviously, we met them on in an informal basis yesterday afternoon, but I. I was going to suggest that perhaps we bring them for, uh, in front of this committee for a formal um, hearing to hear their evidence, uh, and because some of the things we heard yesterday were, were very stark and very shocking, and, and I think um, we, we need to be hearing from them, and then we need to be uh, raising those concerns uh, with the EA and with the department. Um, you know, just earlier this week, I, I dealt with an issue of a, of a child in a private school in my own area, trying to get that child into special education and meeting with his parents and, and the authorities and the school principal. Uh, and I think the the, uh, the issue needs to be given greater profile. And clearly, there was a huge frustration uh, from the principals we met. They, they do feel, I think, that they're not being listened to. Uh, and perhaps they and their colleagues not valued, and I think that's intolerable if that's the case, and it needs to be addressed. Yeah, thanks for fully agree with everything you've said this morning. To bring Deputy Chairperson in, Karen Moore. Just reiterate everything that William said. It was very sad and disappointing for us to sit there yesterday and hear the level of frustration um, from the principals, the hard work that they're doing, the passion that they have. Um, and they don't seem to be getting the support, the resources and the investment that is needed. And they don't seem to be listened to in terms of their expertise. So um, I would agree with William. I think it's very important we get them on to a public um, session with them here. And as a committee, we follow through and keep it high on our agenda. Thanks, Karen. Absolutely agree. Um, and thank members for the attendance at the informal meetings that we're having to try and ensure that we're engaging with as wide a range of uh, people in education as we possibly can. Um, so we have a, a briefing scheduled. Do you want to come back in? No? Okay. We have a briefing scheduled with the Department of Education with regards to special educational needs provision. Um, I would propose that we invite those special schools leaders to come to a uh, public session of the committee uh, at, at that day. Um, we'll be hearing from department, I think education authority as well, Clark, is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, Chairperson, yes. if members yep. um, consult uh, tabled items, I've uh, provisionally added this to the 11th of March, so it would be department and EA uh, talking about the special educational needs framework, so that's the future, 
um, an, an oral briefing from the Education Authority of this, on the special schools, where they are now, and then perhaps from the strategic leadership group um, after those or before those? It would not be better, Chair, that, that we would meet them before we would have the, the, the department or the, the EA in front of us, uh, because um, at the end of the day, we're, we're more, we are well up to answer those questions after yesterday, but it puts it on the, on the, on the, um, the record and, and public focus if we if we have them here first. I think that would make sense. Okay, well, look, we can confirm, confirm the order of scheduling at our, our former planning session later today, but members content in principle to agree that we invite the Special Schools Strategic Leadership Group to present formally in public session of the Education Committee. Agreed. 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 That's great. Thank you. Okay, then, next item, members. Uh, an issue with regards to the flexibility around school starting age had been raised with me. Um, I had corresponded with the Minister in this regard, um, and no plans to bring forward immediate legislation had been considered. Uh, the issue had been considered by a predecessor education committee, and correspondence had been exchanged with previous with the minister previously or could you speak to previous work uh, conducted in regards to flexibility with school starting age yes chairperson the a predecessor committee because it was the one before the last one had done quite a bit of work of this i think at the time michelle i think was the uh, chairperson i think members might have come to a, a bit of a consensus that they were interested in pursuing um uh, increased uh, flexibility for particularly summer-born children. So if your child is born um, on the 1st of July, they go into the uh, one particular year. If they're born on the 30th of June, they go into a different year. Um, so you can find that a child born on the 30th of June will then be mixing with children which are quite a lot longer. There's some research which suggests that um, the performance of those summer-born children might be poorer at, say, post prenatal transfer, maybe even as, uh, as late as GCSE. And there have been measures taken in other jurisdictions, Scotland particularly, around this. So um, what I could do, Chairperson, is just share some of that correspondence which we'd previously got and um, perhaps uh, maybe write to others. Yeah, are, are members content for that correspondence to be shared uh, with committee members? Um, perhaps we could write as a committee to the department to ask what plans they do have in relation to flexibility for school starting age and perhaps even the likes of current in NI um, and I think the National Education Union, formerly the Association of Teachers and Lecturers, had engaged with the committee previously on the issue. Are members content for us to write to those uh, organisations to seek update with regards to where they're at in their work with regard to school starting age flexibility and we can consider the matter at a, another meeting of the committee? Yeah. Great. Content? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> okay then, members. Uh, Draft minutes are available for the meeting of 5th of February 2020 at page 6. Um, our members agree that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members, uh, item 4, there are no matters arising unless anyone wishes to raise any. Members content? Agreed. Okay. Agenda item five then, members, is our Department of Education, Department of Health, Education Authority and Public Health Agency oral briefing on the mental health and wellbeing framework. The following documents uh, are available for members. A briefing paper from the clerk on the mental health and emotional wellbeing framework. That's at page 15 of your packs. A departmental briefing paper on the mental health and emotional wellbeing framework. That's at page 26. Education Training <coughs> Inspector Report on Emotional Health and Wellbeing in Schools, 2018, at page 34. <coughs> Department of Education I Matter Briefing Paper from 2014, at page 59. Departmental Correspondence on Post-Primary Counselling Services, 2015, is at page 63. And a Department for Education Circular providing a self-assessment audit tool for schools, 2018 is at page 110 of your packs. Can I welcome uh, our officials uh, to the Education Committee today? We have Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing Directorate in the Department of Education. Mark Lee, Director of Mental Health, Disability, Older People Directorate, Department of Health. 
Angela Cain, Head of Pupil Support Team, Department of Education, and Nicola Topping from the Children and Young People Services in the Education Authority. You're very welcome, uh, officials. Thank you very much for coming here today on this really important issue. Um, I'd invite officials to make a short presentation of no more than 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'm sure you'll be glad to take questions from the committee. You're very welcome. Thank you. Chair, members, thank you very much for inviting us uh, today. Um, You've done the introductions for me there, Chair, uh, so I'll uh, just have a few short uh, opening words and then uh, we're open to questions. So thanks uh, for giving us this opportunity today to discuss the work that we're collectively doing in relation to emotional health and wellbeing for children and young people whilst they are in education. Um, since I took up post last uh, November, you'll not be surprised to hear that every principal and teacher that I've met uh, has emphasised the daily challenges they face in supporting and addressing the emotional health and well-being of their staff and uh, pupils. We know that many schools are providing excellent support, often going the extra mile to give what help they can to pupils and their families. Issues being faced by our children and young people, however, are becoming increasingly complex. Providing support and tackling these challenges is therefore a key priority for us. We recognise that education cannot do this alone and have been working collaboratively to solve these problems. Indeed, in a time of reduced resources and added pressures, we need to work both smarter and together more than ever to achieve better outcomes in this area. Just taking you back to the beginning of this current journey in relation to developing uh, an emotional health and wellbeing framework, in 2018, we commissioned the National Children's Bureau, NCB, to undertake research to identify where the gaps exist, perhaps more importantly, what works and what doesn't. It will come as no surprise that factors identified by NCB uh, as contributing to poor emotional uh, well-being included <coughs> the online world and the potential for online bullying, the pressure to conform to unrealistic physical and lifestyle expectations, as well as the risk uh, of exploitation. Childhood, childhood adversities, including poverty, emotional and physical abuse and neglect, and academic pressures due to increasing competition for uni university places and in the job market. <clears throat> in terms of what works to support the children and young people, NCB identified four factors. An overarching culture of well-being within the education <coughs> setting, a, a skilled and supported workforce, universal prevention provision supplemented with targeted intervention, uh, examples of those being existing counselling services and nurture groups, and flexibility to tailor provision to incorporate structured and informal approaches and to draw on external expertise when required. Outside of school, NCB also highlighted the critical role of parents and carers in supporting emotional well-being, particularly in building resilience from the early years onwards and in youth work in facilitating the building of good relationships with young people in a less formal setting than schools to benefit their well-being. The challenges and barriers to supporting positive emotional well-being identified by NCB were funding, in particular the reliance <coughs> on existing overstretched budgets and a lack of additional longer-term funding, which mm -hmm. makes sustaining an effective programme challenging. The lack of practitioner knowledge and associated confidence to deal with emotional well-being the availability of effective staff training was raised as a concern, as well as a lack of time and resources to access it. Engaging with parents and carers, schools often struggle with this, but clearly recognise the importance of it for the child's development and to reinforce the positive work being done uh, in schools at home. Referral pathways for a child needing specialist support, or indeed if school staff require advice or guidance to better support a pupil, and schools not knowing which organisations or interventions to trust and how to access or fund these. We received the NCB findings in May of last year and ha since then have been working with the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency and the Education Authority to develop the framework. The main emphasis of the work undertaken so far is on promotion, prevention and early intervention in schools alongside our work with health colleagues to clarify the structures of support and existing referral pathways when extra help is needed, and this was a key issue identified by NCB. Our overall aim through this work is to empower our children and young people to take care of their emotional health and well-being, to help them to build resilience as a way of facing challenges that will inevitably occur in life, and then reach a time 
where fewer children and young people will require specialist intervention from mental health services. Of course, this is only a start. We are considering how pupils and staff can be further supported on the ground through a holistic <coughs> multidisciplinary <coughs> service model. We already have health professionals and community organisations working with schools alongside the Education Authority support services. So this is something we want to enhance. <coughs> it's likely that we will need additional resources to support and sustain this. I've been referring a lot to children and young people in education, but the overall ethos members does apply equally to those working with uh, them and their needs. Uh, sorry, overall ethos applies equally to those working with them and their needs are just as important. We can't expect them to support others if their own mental health is suffering, and this will be another key aspect uh, of our work. So we need to empower teachers and make sure they're equipped and supported to help children and young people within the school environment. We intend to consider how teacher education and continuing professional development can help achieve this aim and consider the curriculum resources that are available for them to use in the classroom. As the framework is being developed, we've been engaging with stakeholders to seek their views. Officials from the department and PHA presented proposals for the framework to the all-party group on children and young people in September of 17. Officials also met with the Belfast Youth Forum uh, in November 19, and we're currently engaging with focus groups representing parents and carers through Parenting NI. We will continue, continue to engage with all those with a vested interest in the emotional health and well-being of children and young people to ensure we can deliver a model of support that will make the most impact, deliver positive outcomes, even though the best outcomes may only become apparent in the longer term. Chair and members of the committee, that concludes the opening statement. Um, we're keen to establish a good working relationship with yourselves as we move forward with this uh, agenda. Uh, and we're happy to take any questions. Okay. okay, thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, bring members in uh, straight away. Daniel McCrossan. Yeah, so, some of the biggest challenges uh, within our schools uh, has been uh, uh, mental health, and it's been discussed at, at almost each of the committees since the restoration of uh, the Assembly, and it's a great concern for mm -hmm. many public representatives, and in particular for parents and for teachers. Uh, there are great challenges in the classroom. Many of the uh, school principals or teachers that I have met with in recent years have told me that uh, uh, a lot of their demand is around dealing with some of the stresses that that child brings from uh, external influences outside of the classroom. So issues at home, poverty, that child may not have had a breakfast th that morning or even supper from the night before. Uh, and this is leading to huge, huge issues. And the difficulty within our education systems but is that teacher has to focus all its energy on that one particular <coughs> child that, that may be in need at that particular time and then obviously the rest of the class then uh, isn't receiving the necessary attention. Um, so really what has been uh, proposed to the department in order to tackle some of those great challenges within, uh, within the classroom in terms of supporting the teacher and obviously supporting the child to ensure that child gets the necessary support uh, that it needs. Um, I'm going to open it up to colleagues if they want to jump in, because uh, uh, some of them will have been involved in this longer than I have. I think um, what we've managed to obtain through the NCB research is evidence of what works well in the classroom, what works well at a system level across the education sector. Um, at the minute, there's a lot of work that goes on through the Education Authority in terms of programmes which are de uh, delivered in, in the education sector. Um, what we have identified during the course of development of this framework is that we need to take a whole school, whole child approach in terms of emotional wealth, uh, well-being. Uh, so it's child-centered, but it's about wrapping services around the child and making sure that in the education sector and the setting that everyone that comes into contact with children is properly informed, trained, knows the signs to spot and is able to uh, refer, if needed, to the appropriate services. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Sure. okay. Uh, William Humphrey. Yeah, thanks very much, Chairman. Chairman, can I just ask through you, this session is billed Department of Education, Department of Health, Education Authority, Public Health Agency, Mental Health and Wellbeing Framework, Oral Briefing. Where are the Department of Health and the Public Health Authority? Well, I'm from the Department of Health, yeah. Monkley. Well, Right. You're not billed as being from the Department of Health, according to this? Department of Education? Uh, that is clearly an error on my part. Yep, sorry, it's a clearly an error. If the member looks at his uh, covering information, I think that is the billing is correct, that is Department of Health. 
So my, my mistake entirely. Is it is it worth even giving <coughs> all our officials a, a short opportunity, maybe willing think, to, to so reduce themselves and to, to okay. say where their their work yeah, uh, fits into the yeah, framework? That, that'd be the helpful. Point, yeah. Point I was going to make, Chairman, because yeah. because it's, I mean the whole thrust of what we've been talking over the last number of weeks mm -hmm. here is um, about a joint upness, mm -hmm. and that's why I was concerned that. Uh, Department of Health wasn't here, but be assured that you are here. <laughs> Absolutely. So maybe we'll hear from you. Yeah. Then. But do you want me to say a little bit on yeah. joint working in and some of the Go kind ahead, of priorities? Yeah. So, um, you said my, my title is Director of Mental Health, Disability, and Older People. Um, uh, uh, clearly, a lot going on in mental health at the minute. You'll have seen in the um, uh, uh, d document, uh, the new decade document, the commitments to publishing a mental health. Uh, action plan uh, within the, the first uh, couple of months of the Assembly being back and a uh, mental health strategy by December. Um, we've also been doing quite a lot of work looking at the child and adolescent mental health services, uh, mainly focused on responding to the Children's Commissioner's still waiting report. Uh, and there's an, an inter, uh, interdepartmental group which has been set up to oversee that work uh, in particular. And Department of Education uh, colleagues sit on that group uh, with myself, along with um, other uh, interested departments, uh, arms length bodies, uh, and some third sector partners. Um, there is a, an update report published recently on progress against that, uh, the, the recommendations made by the Children's Commissioner uh, around still waiting. Um, I also have responsibility for um, issues such as autism, uh, where we're starting to think about a refreshed autism strategy coming through. Um, and certainly, I'd say we're, we have uh, very good uh, working relationships with our education colleagues. We uh, are, have been heavily involved in uh, this framework right from the off. Uh, in fact, a couple of different parts of the Department of Health have been involved. Um, colleagues both from the Health and Social Care Board and from the Public Health Agency have been attending and, and input into uh, to the development of this framework. It's something we would see as absolutely key. I think we'll... Uh, a theme that will run through our work on mental health is the importance of uh, early intervention prevention and, uh, and building resilience. Working with young people is a, an absolutely uh, critical part of that. Um, uh, so the, the partnership that we have, the kind of ongoing engagement between the two departments in the, uh, the development of the, the framework uh, is key and we will continue to be closely engaged in that work. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, go ahead, William. Yeah. So, so how then... Uh, Claire Nintus is a uh, governor at the Girls Model in West Belfast. Um, recently I attended a governor's meeting and was shocked to see the, uh, the amount of money that is left by the time everything is paid out in terms of heating, lighting and the on, staffing. But it, is that the disposable of the principal to actually spend on the school? I was further shocked then to see the amount of money that is spent on buying in professional services, including counselling. Um, and I've spoken to principals across North Belfast around this issue, and they all say they're having to spend <coughs> frontline education money mm -hmm. on buying in services. So listen to what both Mr Irwin and Mr Lee have said this morning. How can we get a closer working relationship to actually mean that that money that is allocated to the, which is hugely needed, given what I've just said earlier about the money that's spent on fixed costs, that that money can be invested in education as it's meant to be as opposed to buying in much needed it has, it has to be said um uh, professional help mm -hmm. do, do you go no. ahead yeah. so i'll maybe say something about the <coughs> child and adolescent mental health services and i'll let you say something about school counseling so um I, 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 there may be a relationship here with the the waiting times and the pressures on uh, child and adolescent mental health services i'm sure but certainly we would recognize that waiting times uh, for um, referrals into child and adolescent mm. mental health services uh, are too long. There are too many breaches of the um, uh, the nine-week target for uh, referrals to be dealt with. Uh, we are, uh, as part of the work across health on, on pressures, we're looking to see what additional funds we can put into child and adolescent mental health services. Um, funding for, for CAMS has doubled over the, the last 10 years or so, but the, the pressures have, uh, have gone up probably even, uh, uh, even more significantly. So um, we are aware of that the pressure on our services. Um, I'm sure education colleagues would recognise the importance of us trying to put more money into CAMS. We would certainly, again, support, and we've been discussing, kind of need to invest on the education side as well. 
Yeah, so I mentioned at the start that there was a need to invest further in this area, recognising the pressure that schools <coughs> are under. Um, I think there's a longer term issue and there's the immediate needs that need to be met within schools. In terms of the longer term, we want to get to a point where we have a model of prevention and early intervention, which then mitigates the need for that specialist intervention further down the line, but we're obviously not there yet, and that's the whole school, whole child approach that I talked about in terms of the framework. In terms of needs now, the independent counselling service for schools would be the primary universal service, which is provided to post-primary schools through the Education Authority. Um, Nicola could perhaps cover that in a wee bit more detail Surely. in Surely. terms of how that operates. Surely. Um, we've just recently, the Education Authority has just recently renewed the contract uh, for the independent counselling service for schools. Um, it goes through a procurement process and its external providers. That came into being on the 1st of September 2019. It is available to all post-primary schools uh, in Northern Ireland, both mainstream and special. Uh, the number of sessions that are provided depend on the enrolment of the school. Um, so for example, um, up to 500 children, you will get three sessions per week and a drop-in. But if you have up to 1,000 pupils, you will get five sessions and a drop-in, just as an example. So it varies based on the, um, the enrolment within the school. Um, referrals for the service come from children and young people themselves, uh, a parent, uh, or from a representative from within the school. And the children can access that through a post box, through a referral note to a specific teacher, um, and then they can access a period of counselling within that, um, where they will have an assessment session with a counsellor and then a number of sessions to address the issue that they are experiencing. Um, it is a very, high, very well utilised service, as I'm sure you can imagine, and schools value it very highly. Mark, you made reference to the fact that funding for CAMS has doubled. I think everyone around the table will know that obviously the pressures in this, in this area Absolutely. have grown exponentially. Yeah. Uh, there is a huge, huge societal problem around mental health, suicide awareness and general well-being. I think, um, and it's good that both departments are here this morning, but I do think that they're, and I welcome the decision that the executive has taken of establishing a committee mm -hmm. to look at this in particular, but I do think there is a need and Listen to what you said, uh, Ricky, in terms of not being there yet, mm -hmm. and I think I think everyone would agree with that. But there is more work to be done. But I think, as well as with health and public health authority education, I think communities need to be involved in this as well, because obviously, I am aware of them supporting some groups that are working in this field as well, um, and and local government. And I think there is a much more joined upness required around all of this, so that we don't have duplication, we don't have wastage. And that the resource that you right identified, Mr. Irwin, earlier on as being um, limited, particularly in, in difficult economic climate that we have, is really focused uh, on, on addressing this problem. If I could just add to that, I think that's absolutely correct. And therefore, we would also look at other settings in terms of what's provided through the voluntary community sector in terms of support for children and young people, uh, also through the youth sector, where very often children and young people will feel more confident be able able to speak to people in the youth sector more so than statutory services, uh, so we need to recognise that. Um, and also peer support from their friends and colleagues who may have experiences and will be able to help and identify um, their friends who need some assistance. So there's a range of activity there that we just we need to come up with a, a model of support. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, thanks. I won't bring other members in, but given you've mentioned it there, Ricky, what I, I think we, well, I was anyway, members can agree or disagree with me, expecting us to be closer to that model of support at this stage um, mm -hmm. in terms of the readiness of an emotional health and wellbeing framework. What, what is the time frame for being able to present an actual framework or model of support to the committee? So we have a working document at the, at the minute. We have a working group which, uh, as Mark says, has BHA, Health and Social Care Board, Department of Health ourselves and the Education Authority on. We're looking at bringing up membership from other departments, potentially the DOJ and if needs be DFC in terms of support that they provide to the voluntary community sector. In terms of timing, I would say we're aiming to have something 
by the end of this calendar year, preferably before then. Um, there are existing models of support out there. What this framework is trying to set down on paper is provide a practical guide for parents, for schools, so they know exactly where to go to in terms of uh, specialist interventions that may be needed, but also in terms of some of the other <coughs> evidence-based interventions that may already exist and are being delivered. So we're just trying to bring it all together. Okay, and what are those existing frameworks to which you refer? I will defer to Ops or <coughs> Nicola to talk about In terms of interventions, interventions or frameworks themselves? Well, Ricky refers to existing frameworks that this framework would interventions link together. What what are, are like is that the I Matter program, for example? Is it, is it other I Matter would be the one you mentioned. Um, the audit tool that we had rolled out to schools a couple of years ago. So we're really looking at the resources for schools. We want to work with SEA in terms of. I know you would all be aware of the RSE hub that they had done, and we would like to do something similar. Again, it's all resource dependent, but something on emotional health and well-being and. Just revamp a lot of the resources for schools we recognize that we need to support our schools and our educational settings directly both from education and health it has to be a multi-agency approach and i know that the children's commissioner had said that in the still waiting report was key and we would agree with that um, and then we want to have a look at the evidence base for a lot of interventions that schools are bringing in a lot of them aren't necessarily haven't been evaluated we, we're not sure of the effectiveness of them but there happens to be funding in the community sector for those so they are bringing them in in the absence of anything else we want to just to take a closer look and see what would be best supporting for our schools but we recognize that there is no one size will fit all for schools and we want to have a multidisciplinary approach there are programs like schools of sanctuary for example um nurture uh, there are a range of interventions out there, so it's really about gathering the evidence from those in terms of their effectiveness and deciding whether they can be scaled up. Okay. This could lead me into another number of questions I have, but I'm keen to bring members in first today. So, um, Daniel, did you want to come back in on this specifically? Yeah. Can uh, you keep it brief? Yeah, no problem. Nicola had mentioned uh, the counselling services. Uh, could, could you repeat the numbers for me? Just a th thousand pupils is what? Um, sorry, I can say one, uh, I can give you the details. So if you have an enrolment of one to 499, you get three sessions per week plus one drop in. If you have an enrolment of 500 to 999, you get five sessions and one drop in. A thousand to 1,499, you are getting eight sessions and a drop in. And if you have 1,500 plus children, you are getting 10 sessions per week and, and a drop in. Now, that is based upon that, that's new for this current contract. Um, and it is based on an evaluation that took place that said we need to be needed to be thinking about where the enrolments uh, were bigger, that that um, schools had access to more sessions. Also, within this contract, we have added in an additional four weeks uh, to the contract, so that at the end of the school year in June, those children who maybe need just a little bit of extra support to get them into the summer have an extra two weeks there. And we've also put in an extra two weeks at the end of August, particularly when exam results are coming out, um, so that those children who may uh, want some support at that time can access it. And, uh, just on that, uh, just to be specific, these, just to clarify, these sessions that you're talking about, mm -hmm. say it's five sessions mm -hmm. per week, is that is it five one to one sessions? Yes. yes, it is. Right, and do you feel that's sufficient to, given the challenges that we face within? Um, I suppose that's a difficult question for me to answer. I mean, sessions um, are forty-five minutes to an hour. A child will get that over a period of six weeks. A child will find that <coughs> helpful. Our young person, I suppose, but inevitably there may be some waiting list uh, behind that. Um, so I suppose from that point of view, perhaps there is an issue there. Um, but I suppose we are largely constrained by the funding mm -hmm. um, in relation to to you know, what we're given to provide the counselling service. Yeah, I, I can understand there's strength in funding, but th this is a huge issue. So up to a thousand pupils, there's five sessions a week, so it only accommodates for five students in a particular school. So say, for instance, and, and we've seen it, uh, mm -hmm. all of us have seen it in our own respective constituencies, mm -hmm. where there's a, a suicide in a mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that has a knock-on effect to an entire year group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
what, 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 what support services are there in Adams? Because sure. I, I, I can tell you, last summer mm -hmm. I attended the funerals of three young people who were very close friends who took their own lives mm -hmm. very close sure. together. And, and the impact of each of those, and I attended each funeral, mm -hmm. and it impacted me, mm -hmm. and I had no personal relationship with either or, or any of them. Yes, and absolutely. I felt it that day myself, mm -hmm. and I looked at those young people in those churches and chapels, and I realised the impact it had. And my immediate question was what support services are in place um, for them? Okay, so there, there is there is some flexibility uh, within the contract, both within the drop-in facility. For a young person who maybe doesn't want counselling, but who maybe wants to drop in and have a chat with somebody who's outside of the core school staffing, there's also capacity if there are an, like an emergency situation for the counsellor to provide support. But when it comes to what you're describing, which we would define as a critical incident within a school or a school community, the Education Authority has a critical incident response team. Um, and uh, all the school has to do is make contact with them. Uh, they are given initial support around the management of the situation. And then we have team members who will go out to a school and in the immediate aftermath of, a, of an incident or a bereavement, they will provide support in the school to help those children normalise <coughs> what they're experiencing, even in very exceptional circumstances. But a lot of children and young people will never, exp never have experienced a loss so it's a psychoeducational approach. We're wanting them to understand grief is normal, even if very painful. How do you look after yourself and where do you seek help? So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a multimodal piece in that we provide management support to the school who may be feeling overwhelmed because those incidents are so incredibly painful and, and difficult support to the pupils on a group or one-to-one -one basis. We then will help and support schools in monitoring those situations. And if we need to put extra support in, uh, we can and have done that, whether it's through our counselling service or another aspect of either EA work or through the community and voluntary sector. So we are trying to be very actively involved um, following incidents like that and have been. Um, certainly over the last uh, three years, the critical incident response team has responded to 141 critical incidents from September 17. Um, so that's a significant number. Both 33 in primary schools, 85 in post-primary schools, and 25 of those being sudden death type situations such as you're describing. Uh, and Chair, if you would just give me one very brief one. Can I just quickly, Dan, can in I ask relation, you to repeat, to Daniel, sorry, just one week second, can I ask you, I'll bring you back in, but can I ask just you to repeat the breakdown between primary and yeah. post-primary of the critical sorry. incidents? yes, absolutely. Um, 33 and 85, was it? 33 oh. and 85, Okay, yes. that's great. Daniel, you want to come back in? Yeah, I, I know there could be a long list, and thank you for your detailed answer there. We all appreciate the great challenges that exist and, and how difficult those circumstances are, and also the level of funding required to ensure proper resourcing of services to support people in need. Uh, but just in terms of, th there's been a spike in these sorts of events, these sorts of incidents over the recent years, and uh, uh, th there may be a number of uh, external influences that have led to that. How big of an influence would you say social media is in terms of, say, bullying uh, that's brought into the, the school itself and, and has an impact on a young person, and also uh, drugs uh, as well, because those two uh, issues um, are becoming very, very significant within uh, wider communities and are certainly having an impact on the mental health of people and then obviously a knock-on effect in, in the school. Um, I suppose I'm not, not sure that, that, that I... Um, I... I would certainly acknowledge that um, they are key contributing factors in terms of the emotional well-being of our children and young people in schools. Um, separately, there's work around bullying and separately there's also work again with the Department of Health and the Safeguarding Board in terms of an online safety strategy, uh, which we're bringing forward hopefully very soon. Um, so we're cognizant of those contributing factors uh, and we're taking that into account, uh, account in terms of our, our own framework and what can be done. Okay, uh, I can bring in Catherine Kelly. Um, thank you for your briefing so far. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk this morning, discussion about joined upness, um, and William touched on it earlier. Um, in regards to the department working with Department of Health, is there much um, of a relationship 
uh, and working together um, between the Department for Communities and Economy um, because a lot of issues um, that a lot of the time it can be housing um, for instance as an example um, that you know relates to a, ch a child's anxiety or you know there's no consistency within their life um, because of maybe having to move constantly or maybe sleeping in a room with maybe five or six other siblings um, and just what is there a good working relationship is it actually happening um, and if it isn't is there is there plans to mm -hmm. Um, in terms of we're working with economy on a joint strategy for looked after children and we would engage with them on the, the like of housing um, so on specific issues we would yes in terms of that because we realize particularly for looked after kids you know when they come to 18 then suddenly they're adults and they're expected to to um, go off into the world on their own um, health do provide significant support but we realise that there's a lot to be done so we do engage with other departments in particular economy there uh, we recognise for this communities as Mr Humphrey said earlier is an area that we do need to build on um, it's something that we do need to look at because they are providing significant support and we don't want that duplication so we do engage <coughs> but I would say that there is work to be done and can I just um, and also now when I have the floor, um, the, there's, I believe steps have to be taken um, to address the lack of awareness identified by Kula, the Children's Commissioner, um, of emotional wellbeing and mental health for children with a learning disability. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any work taking place around that? Um, it's just there wasn't a lot of information within mm -hmm. the briefing um, on it. so. I think, again, it's something that we are cognizant of in all of our work. We do include children who have a disability, and it's something that we are working on. We're wanting to develop indicators for well-being, mm -hmm. and uh, kids with a disability would be a key element of that. Um, and I know our colleagues in SEN would look at that too. Yeah, so special educational needs uh, children with SEN are in one of those groups where they're more likely to suffer in terms of lower well-being. Uh, along with other groups of children, so we are aware of that, uh, and we are trying to build in uh, appropriate interventions in terms of the framework itself and how we bring that forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. Apologies for the late, Chair. The road's not good between Balamoni and Balamina. Uh, how much, could I ask the committee, and thanks very much for coming here to explain a few things, but. Uh, can I ask how much extra pressure it would be on the teaching staff and regarding the provision of health and well-being at schools? And are there any plans to expand <coughs> training for teachers and at what cost and to what level of expertise? Good questions. I, the detail of which I wouldn't be able to provide uh, right here and now. I mean, we're aware of the pressure that does exist on teachers uh, in terms of their time uh, and the competing priorities that they have. Uh, in, in terms of scaling up teachers, as I said earlier, it would be important for us in the framework that teachers are part of the solution and are appropriately trained and able to identify the signs and uh, make the referrals. Um, in terms of facts and figures, I, I wouldn't have that. I'd have to come back mm -hmm. to you in, in terms of the detail. Um, may I? Yeah, of course, yeah. Perhaps I could say that the Education Authority does provide a level of training for teachers in schools. Um, programs such as developing a whole school response to loss and critical incidents, promoting positive emotional health and well-being, uh, supporting students with attachment difficulties. I'm, I'm just giving you some examples. It's effective responses to bullying behaviour, um, supporting schools with behaviour challenges due to mental health. So we do have a number of programs that are available across uh, the education authority for teachers uh, to come out to to try and support the work they're doing. And that would so, supplement their initial teacher education, mm -hmm. where elements of health and wellbeing would also be covered in the modules through the teacher training higher mm -hmm. education institutions. And just to build on that, sorry, there's the optimising achievement model for principals that the EA are developing and delivering to 200 uh, principals, which is a coaching model for them yeah. to recognise their own wellbeing needs and then to uh, reflect that throughout their schools. So we're hoping to extend that into next year as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, one quick. Yeah, yeah, quick supplement. Uh, Go ahead. The Pathways to Access, a multi-agency uh, programme for a help, 
How do you plan to help children to begin to build up the confidence uh, to look after their own health and well-being? And uh, how do you plan to help them at schools? And just to add on from that, there, sorry, social media. Are there any plans to uh, somehow stop social media during the lessons? Put phones in the away, so on, so forth. <coughs> stop children interacting in social media. I think on the latter point, a lot of that is determined by the school policies that they put in place around the use of phones. Um, at a policy level, we haven't got into the detail of that. As I mentioned earlier, we are working with health on an online safety strategy <coughs> uh, in terms of recognising the harms that um, social media and other aspects of the internet uh, provide. Um, in terms of the first point, uh, I suppose it's back to what <coughs> I've made previously about a whole child, whole school approach. Um, it's about teachers, those who come into contact with children being properly informed. It's about uh, programmes for parents. Uh, it's about informing uh, youth settings. Um, it's, uh, it's about providing a range of services which will benefit uh, children and young people's emotional well-being. So it's, it's a broad spectrum of interventions and that's what we're trying to articulate in this framework. Okay, thanks, okay. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Boris. Uh, Robbie Butler. Thank you. Chair, um, guys, I can't overstate this, genuinely can't overstate this. I think this is probably one of the most important pieces of work that any committee or any, any uh, body like yourselves will undertake, given the, the growing crisis that we face. So you're just new into the job in um, November, so I wish you well. I met you before, Mark, and met you yeah. for the first time. Genuinely wish you well, and, and, and I know that this committee will work very uh, fastidiously with you, but we probably will push you, so I'm sure we'll have you back. Um, so I've really two questions. Um, so in relation to the Protect Life 2 strategy, there's on, only limited reference made uh, to education, and particularly prevention, and I've, I've, I've stated this to the uh, stakeholders uh, that have some reservations. It's a great strategy with some limitations in it. Um, do you think that this limits the extent of input from this framework, by, particularly by one of your partners being the PHA? And you may or may not think that if you do, is it a risk, um, given the, the tragic incidences that, um, uh, that my, my colleague here has alluded to and, and what has happened recently uh, at the start of 2020? Uh, I don't think we would see that as being a, an inhibitor on us. I think uh, certainly colleagues who lead on particular two strategy have been very involved in the development of this, of this framework to date. Uh, and I think the, the mental health strategy that we're developing gives us an opportunity to really strengthen that focus on uh, prevention and early intervention uh, to, okay. you know... And I sit on the Protect Life 2 uh, stakeholder group as well. So there's lots of opportunities which we want to capitalise on. And indeed, our health colleagues helped us draft a suicide and self-harm guidance for schools a couple of years ago, which we issued out. Uh, so we're, we're very cognisant of that and, and want to build uh, on that. I appreciate that. And, and I do get how we work in tandem with the mental health strategy and why there's sometimes there's obvious crossovers and sometimes where there's not. But my particular question is in around the preventative piece. So intervention is fine and, and Protect Life 2 does that very well, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. My concern would be in the preventative piece, which is going to rely on, on, on another developing strategy, which is the mental health piece. Uh -huh. And in terms of preventive, Pete, you're thinking about just building general emotional resilience, are yes, you, and yes. awareness mm -hmm. and those kind Particularly of things? Yeah. Yes. So I, I think they probably... They have a broader focus than, than just suicide, I would say, which is probably why they, they maybe um, don't come through as strongly in that strategy. I think they will come through uh, as part of the reason why we're developing this framework. And, and I, I would imagine, not preempting any decisions by the minister and others, but I'd imagine that, that that focus on building resilience, building an awareness, knowing where to go and to seek help when you need help will be a, a key strand of the work on the mental health strategy. And I hope I'm not misquoting the, the education minister on this one. He said that the, they would be looking at this as a cradle to grave approach and, and where education fits into that. Second question, if that's okay, Chair. Um, so it, this is, uh, I think you, you um, Ricky, had, had listed the partners in the development of the framework. So what voice is given to the other stakeholders of the, the framework creation? Um, when we're all agreed here that uh, there needs to be a multi-agency solution, the voices being that of the parent, the carers, community voluntary sector especially given that there um, will be evidence coming to the fore of good practice, and I know of some great practice in, for instance, the Craig Avon area. So, uh, yes, in terms of parents, we are engaging through Parenting NI. Uh, I think some of that engagement has already occurred, and there will be future um, engagement. 
I think in terms of the voluntary community sector, we, we have an opportunity to be better on that. Yeah. Uh, and as we go through the next weeks and months to bring them on board in terms of <coughs> the level of services which, which are, are out there. Um, the youth service as well, I mentioned, it would be important for us to be engaging with the EA, uh, which, which we do, but to bring on board youth service uh, staff in terms of their experiences and how best to capture that uh, in the framework. Um, our, our, our youth service also do a regional assessment of need uh, in which they seek the views of young people um, and they um, literally get thousands of responses. <coughs> I, don't, I don't have the detail with me. But um, so obviously that they are key to that and we've been talking about that within the context of the, the framework as well about the voice of children and young people in particular. And then of course uh, the Children and Young People's Commissioner mm -hmm. uh, and there has been engagement there and there will be future engagement. And we'll continue to engage with the likes of NCB and others uh, on this work going forward. I can't write as fast as you guys talk, especially you. You talk as fast as me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so you do. Um, I think it's I think it's uh, it's really important, and and, and I'll just uh, these guys get bored of hearing it, but I just love the the analogy of not relying on teachers to. To, for the full, for the full, answer. Yeah, for the the answer because mm -hmm. you can't expect teachers mm -hmm. to be the disciplinary and the academic um, and then rely on them to do the whole mental health, well-being, the resilience counsel. and the, the intervention piece. The council's okay because we're already doing that independently. So I think the, the probably for me the biggest barrier is going to be the curriculum, looking at the curriculum and, and how we tie in those partnerships. We will be best suited to deliver the wellbeing piece. And it's not the, I'm not speaking for the committee, just it's, it's my piece, but I will be pushing it forward. So I think that what you'd said is that in terms of talking to community and voluntary, perhaps identifying that best practice might mm -hmm. be a really important piece of work. I think the parent parental aspect as well is very important, given obviously the time involved there, and we just we need to be conscious of all of that. So I keep saying this whole school, whole child approach, but the, it is very important. It is the model that we're centering the whole framework around everyone that's wrapped around the child. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, Thank you. Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if you can just bear with me, because I'm going to probably jump over the place here. I just wanted to come back in on the counselling. Um, Daniel has covered also with Nicola. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't want to say if it was su sufficient, and I can say <coughs> it's not. Listen to those figures. It's actually more shocking for me to hear that in the size of a school of a thousand children, there's five sessions per week. Mm -hmm. But I hear it from principals and teachers every, every day, as does everyone else. And this isn't in any way to have a go at. This is about you know, us you know, looking at the needs and investment. Um, as a parent of a son who, in year 10, they, uh, the class lost their best friend, mm -hmm. um, the, the crisis um, intervention was excellent, mm -hmm. when it came under school, I have to say, but it's too short term. Mm -hmm. Um, it had a detrimental impact on that, cl that class of boys, um, and, it, and it showed out, it bore out in their, in their exam results when they, when they came to GCSE. Um, as, uh, obviously, as parents, we, we provided what support was needed, but you know, I think when they're in the school together, they were grieving together, it was too short term, so it's something that needs to be looked at. And it, it, I don't know, Daniel went over it in length, so it just shows you how sort mm -hmm. of taken back we are today in relation to that, so it needs to be invested invested in. So listening here and, and reading the brief, it, it's looking that what is available in our schools at the minute is that counselling, the AI Matter project, and Ricky, you mentioned nurture. So there's around, is it 33 nurture units that's funded? 31, I think. 31 for the whole mm -hmm. of the north. So there has been a lot of training um, done over the last number of years um, uh, in schools. So I suppose it's is, um, the time frame now for, and it was on the New Deal investment for nurture units. So what I would ask you is, is there a time frame now to uh, roll that out um, as the investment there? Are you aware of it? So uh, <clears throat> the minister um, is aware of the commitment that was previously made around continuing on the nurture units which exist um, and also the other aspects that have been taken forward through the whole school nurture approach which yes, perhaps I'll ask Nicola to give a wee bit more detail about but mm -hmm. just in terms of where we are with funding obviously without uh, knowing the funding for future years, we're not in a position to make any decisions around 
uh, nurture specifically or anything uh, at that matter, for that matter, but the Minister is considering whether nurture would be expanded. Uh, so that's on the table. But mm -hmm. Nicola could talk a bit more about nurture as well. Surely. I suppose there are, there are two strands to the work that the Authority um, facilitates in relation to this. We have a nurturing <coughs> approaches in schools service, and it has two strands. It supports the 31 nurture classes um, that you've mentioned and that are part of the signature project. And it is also providing support to those schools who wish to take forward a whole school approach to nurture. Um, so recently, um, I think 256 schools were engaged in training around that, training nearly 2,000 teachers um, to, to actually look at nurturing approaches to create a warm, safe, inclusive environment um, and begin to look at that um, aside from the actual nurture classroom. Um, because anything that we do... Uh, there is, is good for all children. Um, so there are two strands to the work that are being undertaken uh, regularly in an ongoing way. We, we also have other programmes, um, Ricky mentioned at Schools of Sanctuary, um, which peculiar, more, well, not peculiar, that's the wrong word, specifically in, in sort of in Belfast and Derry with the urban villages. Yeah. Um, so some yeah. schools have taken that route instead of nurture, particularly where they have a number of newcomer children. Um, and then our intercultural education service is working there. Um, again, inclusivity, helping children understand the intercultural dimension of our society. Um, so th those two things are currently going on as well. Um, okay. Um, I suppose uh, just finishing there on the community and volunteer sector. So we've heard today here and we know, I suppose, so the most of the work that is relied on, the support is coming from the community and volunteer sector. Um, and Ricky said we could do better. Robbie highlighted it. And for me, I have to say, it's disappointing to hear at this stage that the community and voluntary sector is not involved in the working group. Um, the community and voluntary sector should be involved from the start. Um, they are there delivering. Um, my approach to it, Ricky, you've talked about the whole school, school approach. I'm a firm believer of community, school and families together. Mm -hmm. We're a one unit. We can't, schools can't be expected to do it on their own. Um, the support is needed there within the schools and families. I come from a very, very strong community background. The community sector in my city, particularly in the neighbourhood renewal areas, have been delivering in schools for 15, 20 years or more. The expertise is there. The schools couldn't exist without them. Um, but yet, we, you know, we in government are the ones that are leading it. And our departments feel that community and voluntary sectors brought in at the end. And like Catherine has said, those other departments should be involved because housing and poverty does not, does, does not just affect groups of looked after children or others. They ex uh, uh, you know, affect many within our community. So I would like to see within the working group, before it goes any further, that those groups are brought under it um, and very much involved in the co-design of, um, of what we do for going forward. I'm disappointed in terms of just maybe getting a lack of detail around time frames here and maybe that the framework will be ready at the end of the year. Um, uh, we would have liked to have seen a wee bit more movement on that. I know teachers and principals, would, um, uh, they're crying out for it. The pressure sits there on them and our young people and they don't have the tools and they're not equipped to be able to provide the support to both the, the young person and the family. William has raised around the budget, so I'll knock over it, but we need to ensure that it doesn't come out of frontline budgets and we need to be looking at investments that goes in um, on, on that. And Ricky, you you'd said when you were given your briefing around everyone in the school community trained and informed. So again, when would that happen? When, you no, know, have you set a target? Have you set a date? Because we can sit and talk about aspirational things, but it, you know, Daniel described our crisis in terms of suicides. This is happening daily, and um, people are turning around and they don't know where to turn to. Um, so that, and I will just finish saying around in relation to the curriculum, there's reference around minimum standards within uh, the curriculum uh, around emotional resilience, well-being. So I was just wondering, um, as, as their plans and plus to strengthen those guidelines to make them actually a core component of the curriculum. I think I take on board uh, all of those points, uh, particularly in terms of membership of the group, and we'll take that away and uh, engage with 
the um, other departments and look at how best we can get the involvement of the voluntary community sector uh, on that. Um, in terms of the time frame, we obviously would want to bring this forward as quickly as possible. A lot of what will be in the framework in terms of delivery will be dependent on securing the additional investment uh, that I talked about. And I think the committee previously has received a briefing in terms of the financial pressures within the department. We have identified a marker in relation to mental health and wellbeing in terms of £10 million. Uh, of course, uh, what we're able to deliver will depend on whether that money is secured or not. <coughs> uh, if it's not, there are things that we can look at in terms of what's happening already and how we can augment and enhance existing <coughs> services and just have better joined up services. But our preference would be to have the additional investment. And would you know what that investment does? Would you have a figure? Is Ten million. Ten million. Ten million has been. And, that, and that has can been. Can we get a breakdown of that? In the uh, we can certainly today, come back to you on on, on that. Um, I think in terms of how that money would be spent, we want to look at evidence-based interventions, those which will have the greatest impact and outcomes uh, for children and young people. So we haven't stipulated exactly what that would be at this stage. We may need to commission further research in some of these areas uh, in terms of effectiveness. So that is, is, of course, why we're working with our Department of Health colleagues, who are the experts in, in this area. So that is a developing piece. And have you, apart from Department of Health, have you spoke to other departments around finance and some elements of it? Catherine spoke about Department for Economy and Department for Communities. I think there may have been some engagement. Um, very early initial engagement, but um, the focus is between ourselves and health. Um, because in addressing of what um, Kula has said in her report, it's the key multi-agency is what we're focusing on, to provide the support direct for the schools so that they're not having to uh, pay for that out of their frontline budgets. My, my boy saying so both the Department for Communities, Department of Justice, and I'm not sure about the Department for Economy, are on the interdepartmental group looking at the Children's Commissioner's uh, still waiting report recommendations. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure we've discussed the 10 million figure through that group, but we've mm -hmm. certainly discussed some of the interventions that are having an impact and the yeah. need to kind of uh, understand the evidence base and then look to yeah. scale and spread. So some really great initiatives in some places. Mm -hmm. I think what, we, what we'd like to try and drive through this framework is the, the spread of some of those great, uh, great examples that are happening in single places. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair, and welcome the the, the members, uh, uh, the delegation to 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 the meeting. My, my I'm going to seek clarification, Chair, rather than uh, questions. Uh, to Nicola, or maybe two to Nicola. Um, when you were replying to to Daniel, uh, Mr. McCrossan, you were putting out the figures on the uh, on the number of interventions per school population, so on. Um, did you say that it's a private contractor who has got the contract to deliver the counselling service? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a Has period. that started? Oh, yes. Um, uh, the, the last contract ended on the, at the end of August and, and the new one began on the 1st of September okay. 2019. And it's initially for a three-year period with the possibility of extension. And so we procure in advance and it's ready to go as soon as one co contract yes. ends, the other one begins. Okay, so the, it is a private contractor? Yes, and it's more than one. It's more than one contractor more than one. delivering that. We have three contractors who three, provide three, through the procurement process. Three private contractors? Yes. When you were replying to him, Mr McCrossan, uh, I think he was concerned about the what we perceive to be the small number of interventions, the scale of the, 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 the school. What's the relationship then between the private contractor and that private contractor's ability to refer on a pupil who the private contractor is concerned about? Okay. Um, in the main, the, the councillors in the schools will manage the majority of issues that come their way as part of the counselling arrangement where they tend to refer on it will be in relation to um, safeguarding either child protection or potential self-harm concern around suicide and um, they work within the schools 
child protection policy for that. So if a councillor has a concern about one of those issues, they will go back to their key contact or the designated teacher within the school, <coughs> excuse me, and then an onward referral is made either to social services um, or through to the GP or trying to have contact with CAMS uh, if they can in relation to that. Um, so they do refer on, yes, and it's accepted that they do that. And whose responsibility would it be to refer on? Well, within the um, child protection policy within the school, um, it would be it, it would be the school that would make the referral with the councillor's information um, in relation to it. Mm -hmm. uh, do we know if there are any gaps between the counselling service in school finishing and the referral on starting? Um, not that I'm aware of, I would have to be honest and say that, um, because our our teachers in schools who have the responsibility around um, being the designated teacher for child protection, for example, they receive significant training from our child protection support service and they understand the need to pass concerns around safeguarding on very promptly. Um, so it would be rare to find that there is a gap between those two communications and then out to an external um, service. Um, but I can't say that it has never happened, but I'm not aware, and certainly it hasn't been raised with me. Um, and obviously, I suppose if, if there was a differing opinion about how to refer on, then an individual counsellor through their provider could equally do that. Um, in the interests of the child. So although the counsellor, the professional counsellor, does the initial maybe five counselling mm -hmm. sessions with mm -hmm. the student, mm -hmm. uh, it's the responsibility of the school then to pick it up after that counselling has finished? Um, if there is an, if there is if an issue, an yeah. um, because quite often for the, the, the young person, the, the number of sessions of counselling has maybe addressed the issue that they wanted to talk about and there is no need to refer on. No, and I'm only talking but about where there is a need to refer Where there is a need to refer on. So it's on. the responsibility of the school, the designated It teacher. may be the designated teacher for child protection if it's that type of issue. It may be the key contact. Um, but that is also about ensuring that the school are aware that there is an issue over and above yeah. whatever the child is yeah. going for. Yeah. Accepting all that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Can I ask you, just to clarify for me, in terms of the nurture units, yes. which I think everybody agrees are important, yes. how do we benchmark against other parts of the UK in provision of nurture units? Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that. It's, it's not <coughs> one of my areas of respons direct responsibility. Um, you were the I, one raised it. I, I know. Yes, I, well, um, no, maybe Ricky started. But, um, <laughs> well, I mean, maybe I can jump in there. Yeah, but, sure, um, I can say so. Uh, no, I understand the committee is going to receive a briefing on nurture yeah. uh, in a couple of yeah. weeks, so yeah. we, we hopefully will be able to provide you with more detail okay. then. Um, but I did have a meeting with other uh, members of the EA yesterday mm -hmm. on, on this very point in terms of the evidence base that is currently mm -hmm. being collected. Uh, specifically around outcomes-based accountability and a report card and really is anyone better off. So that is happening, but like I say, when we come back in a couple of weeks' time, hopefully we'll have more. answer that question. Okay. Make okay. okay. sure that's in the Good. briefing. <laughs> <laughs> just finally, Chair, just for clarification, um, to Mr Bradley, to Mr Humphrey and to Mr McCrossan, uh, you've referred to the whole school, whole child approach, mm -hmm. right? Now, Mr. McCrossan gave a specific example of a child arriving in to the school, uh, and you immediately said, well, we would adopt the whole school, whole child approach to this particular problem. Just describe to me what is, in those circumstances, the whole school, whole child approach? Um, I suppose, in terms of the framework, We've identified some good practice in schools at the well, moment. I'd, so, I'd rather try to understand what okay. happens uh, when the child walks through the door at nine o'clock on a. So the overall ethos of the school yeah. is one of a supportive culture, is one where there are policies and procedures in place through the school leadership and the principal that supports every pupil. There are referral pathways for those that need additional support. I suppose that's it in a nutshell. 
um, it's about trying to embed that right across the school sector. So we're, we're looking at lifting those examples of good practice and trying to bring them uh, right, spread them right across uh, education. Uh, is there anything you want to add there? No, I think that's I'm sorry. I'm still not sure that I know what actually <laughs> happens when the child walks in yeah. not having a breakfast and uh, arriving on such a morning as this, but... yeah. Is the, okay, is we, there, we, we yeah. look at that. Can, we can revisit that. Yeah. Okay. Is there, and you might not have an answer for this now and you can return to it, but is there a school or a number of schools <clears throat> that demonstrate that type of approach that you could refer to the committee and we could, we could come back. We can come back. Or mm -hmm. engaging with, yeah? Yes, yeah, cer certainly we can come back. Yep. They might be able to that. show us exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, okay. It's only, right, sorry, right. from my own perspective, yeah, Curry Primary School in North Belfast would demonstrate that. Daily, they are excellent, and their principal Ashley Galway. Okay. Yeah, they would be excellent. Example. Okay. okay. Robbie, yeah. do you want to come in on this speci just... specifically? Yeah. Not really. Right. I'll bring, <laughs> I'll bring you back in then. Okay. okay. All right. Justin, <laughs> waiting to come in. All right. Thank you, Chair, and uh, you're welcome to your committee today, and thank you for your presentation. They're all doing very important work. Um, Ricky, you mentioned pressures on children and young people, and number one in that list was the online world. Yesterday we had safety, Safer Internet Day. <coughs> um, in the context of the suicide epidemic, which we're facing, and sadly, and it's devastated so many families, communities, and schools, and to what extent was that used as an opportunity to educate yesterday for parents, <coughs> children, and young people, and teachers, um, above and beyond just a press given? Um, I think primarily that work in terms of Internet Safety Day uh, and the development of the online safety strategy is being taken forward through the Safeguarding Board, NI, so uh, I wasn't uh, in attendance on that, so I can't comment specifically on what, what was done. But we are working very closely with DOH and SBNI on the strategy, and we hope to bring that forward very soon, and that will set out some of the um, practices and good practice that can put out there to inform parents around how to reduce the risk of online harm for their children and young people. So that is uh, work on. Okay, you're right. The strategy you've mentioned, the e-safety strategy, is that separate to the Department of Health strategy or is that the same strategy you're, you're speaking That's about? the same. So it is now called the online safety strategy, I believe, mm -hmm. instead of the e-safety strategy. Okay. And we're yeah, working very closely with health on it. When will that be published? The draft is nearly finished, so uh, we're hoping to bring that forward quite soon. It's dependent on resources to implement it, um, but we're nearly there with it. And who has been consulted on that? Because um, I'm dealing regularly with a person who's working on the ground in schools and probably is the foremost expert on that in that area. Um, a gentleman called Wayne Denner. He's an online safety and cyber, or cyber safeguarding expert. Okay. And he has not been involved. He's a person who's working on the ground in the schools, in the mm -hmm. communities, and... This person who has the most expertise in the area, in the north, has not been consulted and has not been involved in uh, informing that, that uh, strategy. So I'm just, who has been involved in the strategy? The strategy was issued for public consultation last year. Uh, it was right there for eight weeks for public consultation. I'm happy to pick that up and engage with him directly. Mm -hmm. I'm on any points that he may have okay. in terms of the draft itself, but certainly there was a good response and the types of issues in terms of the terminology and that were raised um, was very useful um, in terms of, of where we're going with it. Okay, thank you. Um, how important do you believe that strategy is in helping to inform the system mental health and emotional wellbeing uh, framework? It's key, yeah. in my opinion, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, has the department done any um, assessment in terms of analysis in terms of online bullying and mental health? In terms of formal assessments, I'm not sure in, on the bullying, but we know there's there's certainly a big issue there, and it's something that informs all of our work in terms of across the piece and well-being, um, the impact of, of online bullying. Well, I find it quite astonishing that uh, in a world where us as, as politicians know the dangers of online bullying, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're equipped for the most part to deal with it. For young children who have no, who have no yep. experience and no equipment to be able to deal with that, and we have no knowledge of the impact of that on young people. I'm sure there are um, elements out there, it's just not something that we've done directly, certainly in, in my area. I don't know if there's I think you would know, Rick. Um, there may be evidence coming through the likes of the Young Life and Time survey 
the Kids Life and Time survey and also there's a three yearly school survey uh, which tests and asks children and young people uh, about their quality of life, their self-esteem, bullying and so on. So I would need to go back and look at the evidence that's emerging uh, from, from those recent surveys and we would need to decide whether we need to build in future uh, questions around those specific issues. I think it's getting a bit, it's getting a bit past the post on that. Yeah. Surely uh, we know how impactful that is on young people and surely there should be some sort of data in terms of how that is actually impacting their lives and how, how I think you're right actually we put well-being modules into the young life and times okay. and life and time survey in 2018 yeah. so we can look back at those results and share yeah. those with you um, and see crucial. if there's anything in particular on that that has informed the strategy yeah. the online strategy which the safeguarding board has brought forward so uh, that evidence has been sought mm -hmm. that needs to be a massive key part of it yes. absolutely um, that 10 million figure you, you uh, mentioned, uh, how was that figure reached and is that sufficient to actually address and tackle the issues that are at play here? Uh, that is a marker that's been put down at this stage which probably requires further refinement in terms of looking at the evidence base of the interventions that we know uh, will work. Um, I, I wouldn't have the breakdown of the 10 million with me at this stage. When was um, that figure reached? When, sorry? Uh, probably... It was last year when we were asked for initial pressures. A few months ago. And in terms of everything that we wanted to achieve, both working directly with health to provide support to schools, providing support to schools ourselves, training for teachers, mm. that was where we came up with that size of a figure, which we know will not solve every ill, but it's a, a good step in the right direction. And it's 10 million a year over the three years that we've asked for. Yeah. And we're quite hopeful that we will get that support. So. Okay. Thank you very much for your answers, and uh, you're doing very important work. I wish you success. Thank you. Okay. Robbie. Yep. Very briefly, okay. Robbie Butler. Yeah. You, I'm the only one you ever say that to each other. Well, I've let you in for a second time, <laughs> so don't. You're not going to trust another guy. You're the favourite. Okay. Guys, <laughs> yeah, I'm just. I was just. Um, I think it's really important that we all ground ourselves, whether we're on the committee and you guys too, that, that this isn't a new problem. Mm -hmm. There are issues, and it's a growing problem. That's that's the key thing. I remember in the, in the early 2000s when I worked in the <coughs> were actually I'm working west in North Belfast, where part of my job was to go and do body recovery. And there was there was incidents like uh, Daniel had spoken about incidents of these clusters and stuff. So I was reading through just about the how this came about. The the pupils' emotional well-being program 2007. It morphs into I Matter. It gets a toolkit in 2018. So there's two things in this. I just want to also remind ourselves to, to remember that it's almost impossible to collate the good work that it has done between the agencies, the teachers, the, the professionals, and there are people alive today actually because there was good intervention. But what we can't ignore is actually we have a growing problem. And what I would just like to ask is in, with regard to, to I Matters and, and Fleur in terms of that, look at that. Um, so obviously it is doing some good work, but is it fit for purpose? Mm. That, that strategy today in 2020, and that being the case, whatever the measurement of that, what agility will be built into the framework to make it Good. agile enough mm -hmm. to change to you know changing needs and changing challenges and a change in society? Can I, yeah, can I, I was going to ask something similar. So can I refine that slightly? And if I go, if it's too refined, let me know. But what what is I matter and flair and they appear to be the significant elements of the framework mm -hmm. um you know so as, as robbie says what are they and how can they be are, are they going to be developed further or is the framework i matter and flair in terms of i matter that would be the department's emotional health and well-being program um as you rightly said it started in 2007 and has morphed into that and we are at the minute reviewing it it covers everything that we do from the counseling service to the resources to schools to the self um, assessment audit tool everything that's provided is under the badge of i matter i think it's quite a clever title um in terms of, of the people involvement but we are wanting to look out to check that it is future-proofed and will be there. In terms of the FLARE programme, Nicola, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, that. FLARE is a, is a youth service programme uh, that is in conjunction and in partnership with the Public Health Agency. Uh, it stands for Facilitating Life and Resilience Education and it's provided to young people from the age of eight all the way up to the upper end of the youth service boundary, which is 25 years of age. 
It's facilitated by qualified youth work staff and it is for children who have a level of mental health difficulty and there are kind of three strands to it. So it begins as a, uh, an individual piece of work one-to-one -one between the professional and the young person, um, gradually moving them into a small group and then it may be into a larger group, but the focus is all on mental health, on building resilience, um, being able to talk about what's impacting upon you, where to find help, um, and that exists all across Northern Ireland. Um, and just could you just then finish that out in terms of the measurement? I, I, am, I have no doubt that it has been effective for, a, for mm -hmm. a, a number of our young people, and as I've said, there'll be people alive today because of the interventions and stuff. Yeah. We look at the growing propensity and incidence, um, in terms of the effectiveness of it and then the agility of any new framework to encompass that and other. I think the agility piece is really important actually, guys. You know? yeah. um, I think I mentioned earlier that we're looking at developing wellbeing indicators. We had participated in PACE in 2015, the initial wellbeing surveys that they had done, um, and we have a baseline from there. We'd hope to do PISA 2018, but the rest of the UK weren't participating, so the cost would have been prohibitive. And this is the same, unfortunately, for PISA 2021. Um, we are looking, other colleagues in the department are looking at the Planet Youth model, the Icelandic model. And I think that's a cost of 500,000 over five years, but if, from what I understand, it's a very well respected model. Um, and looking for that, from our point of view, it's for a single year group, and we would like to have a primary and post-primary element to Absolutely, any data yeah. that we have we think that's essential okay. um, and it would reflect what we're doing so we're going to have initial discussions with Queen's and with Nisra in terms of a set of well-being indicators and we're happy to engage with you further on that just as we build on it. I think the agility point is an important one in terms of what we put in the framework and for me particularly around any gaps that we identify in provision and how we fill those gaps in. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, so Thank you. in terms of well-being indicators, then at yes. this moment in time, there are none, there are. and we don't measure well-being of well, children we would, and young people. There are but measures that we can use. We're trying to find what would be the most appropriate to use <coughs> in terms okay. of well-being. We what, have the what results. What do we currently use? We have used the uh, Young Life and Time surveys as most recently in 2018. We put two well-being modules in there, and to give us an idea of, of how things are going to compare to PISA 2015, just to see. Um, and the results were, it didn't reflect the pressures that we're experiencing in our schools to date. The results are pretty good, and we're happy to share those with you. Um, if that would yeah. at all be helpful, is to take up your early point on online bullying, just to see um, the pressures that children are facing. So we're wanting to look at that and just to see if we could design something more bespoke yeah. with our statisticians. I think it'd be useful to take a, an individual briefing on Okay, on no that, problem. that matter. Um, and I mean, in, in your opinion, would, is PISA a significantly more robust measurement too? We had engaged directly with the South Australian statisticians who developed the PISA questionnaires, and it seems fairly robust. The problem is if the rest of the UK aren't going to participate, the cost is about £400,000, which is... Why, why are they not participating? England um, for 2021 were going to and Wales were going to follow them but then they decided to do something themselves with their own statisticians and they aren't using PISA. Now the South Australian statisticians that do develop that are providing a bespoke service. I think Dubai have recently used them and they did offer us that if we wanted to come over and they would develop something bespoke for us for about £30,000. So it's an avenue that we could um, consider. Be good to learn more about that yep. yeah, uh -huh. at a yep. future date. Yeah. Okay Robbie, yeah. That's good. Up. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, members. Um, officials, from my point of view, and the, the committee's obviously responding to youth mental ill health and suicide is an urgent priority for the committee. It's an urgent matter for the executive and the department. So um, I think there's encouraging developments there, particularly in terms of the work done by NCB to identify the key issues. I think I think they've they've done that well. Um, they've set the issues out there and I'll rehearse them again but um, from the feedback that we take from children and young people they've, they've given you the direction you need to progress the framework. Um, slightly concerned as other members have been with regards to the time frame of yeah. potentially another 10 months before that framework would be available for us and let's hope that it might not be as long as that and you might be at the committee uh, significantly earlier than that to give us a bit more detail about what the framework looks like. Also slight concern that the framework is the existing iMatter and Flare yeah. uh, programs 
um, however effective they may be, um, we would obviously hope to see those developed and added to. Um, and particularly in terms of the counselling services, it's my understanding that the Education and Training Inspectorate undertook a review of the effectiveness of emotional health and wellbeing support for pupils in schools and EOTA centres in 2018, and that ETI, similarly to NCV, recommended that early intervention and parental engagement in particular should be a focus, mm. even at primary school age, with digital resilience being a focus at all ages. Um, I think ETI in particular found that of the 79 schools and EOTA centres that responded, around 4,000 pupils were identified with emotional health and wellbeing issues, and that pupils as young as year one of primary school um, repre uh, presented with issues. And, and QUB also undertook a review of emotional health and wellbeing in 2011, mm -hmm. and one of the key recommendations from that was extending post-primary pupil emotional health and wellbeing support for example, counselling services to primary schools. So can you tell the committee if there are plans to extend post-primary counselling services to primary school level? There aren't current plans, Chair, in that regard. Uh, I think what we lack is the evidence base that would support that recommendation at this stage, and we've been engaging with <laughs> health colleagues on that in terms of trying to gather the evidence around the effectiveness of counselling and whether uh, that would apply equally from post-primary to primary. We are aware of other jurisdictions, some of which have extended to primary, um, some haven't, so we, we need to examine this further. Um, I, I would request a detailed briefing on that matter as well then. Um, I think when ETI are making as, as detailed representations as that on, on Queen's University, I would suggest there's a, at least one evidence base that you could be drawing from in that regard. Um, so yeah, we'd be keen to hear a, a more detailed response and briefing from the department as to why there are no plans to extend counselling services to primary schools. Um, in terms of the school counselling that you detailed earlier, that is obviously applicable only to post-primary schools. Okay. Mainstream um, and special. Okay. Um, there's obviously some concern with the the adequacy of the extent of the provision, not the quality of provision, I should hasten to add, but um, is it possible to get a breakdown of waiting lists for those school counselling sessions, which would give us some idea as to how adequate the extent of the provision is. Um, that would be that would be helpful. Well, we'll take that away certainly, and have a look yeah. at okay. Yeah. Okay. In, in terms of in terms of specifics, then um, you'll be familiar with the the youth forum elephant in the room campaign around youth mental health. Um, it has made specific recommendations. Uh, a website for young people designed by young people to provide mental health information, support awareness and to tackle stigma, which would appear to fit with some of the uh, recommendations by NCB. It, it also recommends uh, that mental health be explicitly included in the school curriculum. Um, physical health is obviously explicitly included in the curriculum, but to my understanding, mental health is not explicitly included in the curriculum. Um, and that it be, and that another campaign is, is asking that that be monitored by the Education and Training Inspectorate. It has also recommended for a youth led, government backed mental health campaign, a mental health dictionary, and other campaigns have also suggested that there is a need for peer support, pupil mental health points of contacts at, in our schools. Could you respond to the all um, departments and organisations represented today's positions in relation to those recommendations, which have been live for a while now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think from my point of view, um, certainly some of those were referenced in the NCP report. And the NCP report, as you rightly said, is uh, guiding us in terms of our, our, of our development of the framework. Mm -hmm. So we will look at the recommendations that have come forward from the Youth Forum uh, in terms of the Elephant in the Room report, uh, and if uh, they're appropriate, we, we will build those in. In terms of the curriculum, um, my understanding is that 
there is content within the curriculum at both primary and post-primary through the learning for life and work and the personal development and mutual understanding aspects of the curriculum where issues around personal resilience and mental health and well-being are actually covered. Whether that is sufficient, I don't know, um, but certainly I'm aware that they are actually there. Um, I'll open it up to colleagues if they want to add anything further. Um, certainly in terms of the framework itself, we have engaged with the Youth Forum and we will open up more engagement with them just to keep those dialogues open and, and have that direct link. Okay. Well, any specific response to those particular recommendations at, at this stage? As I said, they've been live for a while and I'm mm -hmm. sure they appreciate the engagement, but I, yes. I, I'm sure they'd appreciate substantive response a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Uh, the difficulty we have is a lot of it is resource dependent and if we get the budgets that we hope, uh, we would um, hope to do an awful lot with them to support our schools. Mm. Okay, well in due course perhaps if you could provide us with a more detailed briefing and response with regards to the elephant in the room recommendations, um, particularly with regards to the the recommendation for explicit inclusion of mental health in the curriculum, um, and indeed all those other recommendations as well. I, mean, I guess not to go through all the NCB matters raised, but they obviously raise a recommendation for universal counselling. I presume that suggests extension to primary level um, and um, cult uh, create a culture of well-being in the school. I presume explicit reference on the curriculum would contribute towards that um, and, and youth work and, and youth services as mentioned as well obviously. Um, the one, one other key issue that appears to be consistently raised is the need for parental participation and parental engagement in mental health, uh, youth mental health provision. Um, what specific actions will be taken or included in the framework with regards to parental participation and engagement on youth mental health? Um, I suppose we haven't got to that level of detail yet, Chair. Um, we're aware of uh, evidence from parenting programmes which have been run through the Early Intervention Transformation Programme, funded through the Deliverance Social Change Funds, uh, the Family Support Hubs and the other uh, interventions which uh, have uh, been very effective, I understand. So we need to look at those. We need to decide whether they get put into the framework and if, if appropriate, they will be. Okay. I think I speak on behalf of the committee to say we we wish you well with an extremely important uh, body of work, but we would like to see and hope that it will be possible to provide more specific actions and specific detail in response to a number of recommendations that have been live for a number of you know for a good time now, um, and hopefully you can return to the committee in the near future to provide us with further updates in relation to this urgent and important work. Any other members, any final comments or questions? No, Robbie? I, 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 did, I did have one, if you'll just... If you'll just uh, and that's, that's to do with the, the chair. Be, be very really, quick, really, really well, well made points, and I don't want to, to prejudice it and give you a in your mouth, but I suspect that agility has been a problem with regard to anything that's formed and just my short time working in, through, with the departments and stuff. There doesn't seem to be that ability to react to even... Uh, evidence of good practice, for instance, or uh, reports and so on. So I think that's the, the point is almost nearly made for that piece on agility that we were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Here's okay. the indulgence, Chair. Okay. Okay. So, Fishes, thanks very much indeed. Um, we look forward to working with you on this important issue. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. thanks very much. Okay, members, I'm just going to ask the clerk to summarise on committee actions in relation to this uh, particular matter. Chairperson, do that directly. So, Chair, I think um, if members will keep me right now, I believe the committee wants to write to the department, um, uh, perhaps indicating its concern around the Independent Schools Counselling Service, uh, uh, seeking also information around uh, waiting lists. And uh, additionally to that, we'd like to see the NCB scoping report, because I haven't seen it. Yep. Um, Perhaps also, Chairperson, I didn't say this, but um, the committee wants to have a, a stakeholder event. I'm struggling a wee bit to identify the correct stakeholders, maybe to ask the department what consultees they've um, 
uh, caught up with so far. And uh, I might sort of cast it out a bit further. And obviously, I would come back to the committee with a list, and members would then obviously supplement that. We can cover that in our planning session later as well, potentially, Clark. Yeah. No Additionally, problem. then, we're asking the department around its plans to skill up teachers uh, in order to deal with emotional health and wellbeing issues, as uh, Mr. Bradley asked. Uh, we're also I think the committee is indicating its concern about the absence of inclusion of the, the community and voluntary sector mm. and suggesting that they should be included. And uniformed organisations. Uniformed organisations. <clears throat> Got that. Um, we're also seeking the key dates uh, for the development of the framework and its rollout, uh, a breakdown of the, the £10 million. Uh, I think we're looking for uh, information on the uh, benchmarking work that they've done on Nurture. That will be for our briefing, which will happen in about two weeks' time. Um, also looking for... Um, now, did they give you good examples of a whole school approach? I didn't hear the school well, exam. Can I make a suggestion there? Um, uh, Angela Keane referred to Curry Primary School. Curry. Um, and I declare an interest as a governor at Edinburgh Primary School. Both of those schools are in North Belfast and both of them have nurture units. So I think it would be a very useful, in terms of the context and what they were talking about, the whole school, whole child approach, I think it would be useful for perhaps Ashley Galway, who Angela mentioned as the principal of Curry, or Lisa Grimison, who's the principal of Edinburgh Primary School, or indeed others, for, for this committee to hear from them at first hand. Uh, so either um, we, we bring, and there obviously there are other schools, um, we, we, we bring those principles to this committee, or I think what might be more useful, as opposed to just sitting listening to, to people, mm. is to actually visit the likes of Curry or Edinburgh, see actually how the day is Robin made reference to, as the child walks in, at nine o'clock. So it's Daniel actually made the Was it right? <laughs> I might have been out of the room. At that I was point. only building on Daniel's um, <laughs> example. Um, that that then the the what happens to the day the child's day yeah. as, it, as it unfolds then and they, and they can give us a really good example. <laughs> I think a visit is much more, I think, impactful uh, for for the committee than perhaps um, principals coming here. Can certainly add that to visit considerations. I would agree. Yep. And chairperson, okay. members are aware the committee predecessor committee did visit both schools. I know they are. They're certainly worth a visit. Members quite right. Um, also, chairperson, I think uh, committee is seeking an update on the online um, safety strategy, uh, and also looking for uh, expressing some concerns and seeking data about the impact of online matters on uh, pupils' health and well-being. So, expressing concerns that about the issue and also seeking whatever data the department has. They did make a reference, I think, to the Young Life and Time survey, so it might be what they're basing that on. Additionally then, I think we're looking for information on their development, the department's development of a well-being indicator, maybe something about the Icelandic model, I haven't heard that before. Um, and uh, additionally then, I think um, perhaps we're also seeking a timescale for the iMatter review. Because uh, again, that was new information, per person. Hopefully, that is all captured. And uh, I'm looking at my staff. Sorry, yeah. Just, Sorry. I didn't get an answer to the question around the curriculum. Um, uh, and I know members went back again, but we still didn't get an answer no. yeah. around. And and it was something that Chris raised at the end. So, um, are they looking at um, resilience and well-being being a core component of the curriculum? Um, I think. The, in, the count, in, in relation to um, the framework, I will, you may have said this, but what groups have they engaged with? Yep. Mm -hmm. Detailed. Um, and I think everything we said today, for time frames, time mm -hmm. scales. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think if we ask the department for a detailed response on curriculum, obviously, but also the, all the elephant in the room recommendations okay. and explicitly just to check in terms of the counselling service it was to seek uh, responses to why it is not deemed um, yeah, extendable to primary as well then. Yes. Members content? I think I think to just make a point. Yep. In relation to the nurtures, if I'm right, um, when the question was asked, perhaps the, the response wasn't as detailed as Robin or indeed Mr McCrossan would have wanted and, and members. I think if I'm right from memory, funding for nurture units provided by, by Department for Communities or was DSD. Years ago, yes. So, so therefore, they might be better equipped to answer that question. 
and that and so therefore that's why I think a visit might be better than the officials. Chair, the member's absolutely right. DSD was the clerk of that long, long ago, and uh, I can remember when it was stopped, when they stopped funding uh, Nurture, and then it went to the signature programme. But it's also just to draw the member's attention is that look at the ETI review in 2018. They only looked at about 80 schools, <clears throat> but they found a third of them had developed their own nurture. And what the education authority said there was that 256 schools had undertaken training. So that sounds about right. That maybe about there's a couple of hundred schools out there doing nurture, yeah. but they're not being funded through the signature program because that only covered 31. So mm -hmm. this is um, so in the, in the intervening three years since there's been a committee, that's a big deal. Yeah. When we visited, I'm not sure, maybe Mr. Newton might have been on the committee when we did visit Edinburgh and uh, to look no, at the nurture. We did visit the one at um, um, King's Pins Road. Aye, and Pim Pins Street. Road Primary School. Aye, yes. As it was then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, but it, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't a minority pastime, but there might yeah. have been about yeah. 50 schools that did yeah. it. Now there seem to be hundreds, so yeah. Yeah. it's... Uh, and the schools, primary schools, providing counselling as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as was indicated in the ETI yeah. review, that that can cost them £10,000 for a full day. Now, you wouldn't get a full day, maybe they would get a half day, and they would see maybe a number of children, but it is yeah. expensive, uh, to be sure. So, Chairperson, if that's all captured... Yep, content, like members are content, agreed, yep. yep. OK, members' agenda item six, then, is our Department of Education <coughs> <or> briefing <laughs> on the consultation on the revised nutritional standards for school food. Can I refer members to briefing paper from the clerk at page 116 and consultation documents at page 120? Can I also then welcome our Department of Education officials to the committee? You're very welcome. We have Margaret Rose McNaughton, Director of Children and Young People's Services, Jill Fitzgerald, Head of School Meals Team, and Judith Hanvey, Regional Food in Schools Coordinator with the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. You're very welcome Thank you very to much. the committee today. Um, can I invite you to make a short presentation of no more than 10 minutes and then hopefully you'll take questions from the committee. Okay. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much and thank you very much for uh, inviting us here today. Um, by way of introduction, I am Margaret Rose McNaughton, um, but I'm no longer Director of Children and Young People. I'm now Director of Transport and um, Food and Schools. We just made that change quite recently. Okay. Um, this is Jill um, Fitzgerald, who's leading the team. Um, uh, uh, consulting on the nutritional standards, and I have with me Judith Hamby, who's the Regional <coughs> Food and Schools Coordinator. Uh, Judith also chaired the working group that uh, drafted the proposed updates. Um, as you know, the consultation document issued on the, the 30th of January. I think everybody has copies of that, that document. Um, I'll, I'll keep this brief, so I'll maybe not go through all of the, the, the points I was going to make. Um, but everybody will know that a healthy, balanced diet is important for everybody, and especially for children and young people. It can make a very important contribution to their growth, development, um, educational performance and attainment. And the um, OECD analysis on the 13-14 beha health behaviour in school-aged children uh, states that children are 13% more likely to perform well in school if they have a healthy weight. So establishing healthy behaviours in children and young people of today will be <coughs> their long-term health and well-being. And in um, addition, as parents and educators of tomorrow, they'll influence the health and well-being of the generations to come. I mean, we know the school environment can have a significant influence on the health behaviours of children and young people, in particular in their food choices. And through the <coughs> curriculum, children and young people are able to develop the necessary knowledge and skills to assist them to make healthy food choices. And it's essential in keeping with the joint DE and uh, Department of Health food and schools policy that all food provided in schools is consistent with what's taught in the classroom. And it's also essential then that all food provided in schools is, is of a nutritional standard that's in keeping with the government guidance on healthy eating. Over 185,000 school meals are provided every school day, so there's a huge um, you know, number of, of, of meals being provided. The current standards that we have were developed over 12 years ago in collaboration with health and education partners and implemented over a number of years. And they reflect government guidance and healthy eating guidance at that time. You may remember the, um, the plate, the healthy plate, which is now the, the Eat Well Guide. That is now the up-to-date government guidance on eating healthily and achieving a balanced diet. So it's all outlined in the Eat Well Guide, and that was then updated in 2016. So as a result, 
our current standards, our current nutritional standards, needed to be updated to reflect those changes. So the department invited Judith uh, to lead a working group of health and education school food professionals to consider recommendations from the Eat Well Guide, along with other relevant reports, and to draft proposed updated standards. The working group that, that Judith led comprised representatives from the Public Health Agency, from the Food Standards Agency, Safe Food, and the EA Catering Service. The initial proposals uh, that the working group um, put forward recommended, among other things, the restriction of drinks to milk and water only, and the restriction of existing desserts to once a week, and a number of restrictions on high fat and high sugar food. But during the development of those standards, we then decided that um, we should liaise with a number of key health and education partners just to get their views on those initial um, proposals. Health partners were very supportive and in particular were supportive of the restriction of drinks to milk and water only and the restriction on traditional desserts to once a week. In general, the education partners were committed to the principle of ensuring healthy food, um, the healthy food options for pupils and the need to educate pupils in healthy eating. But they were concerned that additional restrictions might have a detrimental effect on the uptake of school meals. And this would put financial pressure on the system and result in pupils taking packed lunches or maybe even going off-site to fast food outlets in preference to nutritional, nutritional school lunches. So they asked the working group to um, revisit their proposals and consider ways to balance the recommendations of the Eat Well Guide and the aspirations of health partners on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the concerns and operational issues raised by the educational stakeholders. Uh, because the last thing that we wanted to do was reduce the number of school meals that were actually being taken. So the draft update to the nutritional standards that is currently the subject of consultation is the, reflects the working group's draft proposals. Or sorry, the working group's revised proposals. So following the, the uh, finalisation of those proposals, the department initiated the nutritional standards project, of which uh, Jill is the lead. Um, subject to the outcome of the consultation, obviously, and the availability of funding, we uh, would hope that the nutritional st uh, standards would be implemented in all grant-aided schools from September 2020. So there's a, a short time frame um, for, for when we can implement them. <coughs> the project board itself has membership from the Education Authority, the Department of Health and Education and Training Inspectorate. The updated nutritional standards, when implemented, will ensure that all food and drinks provided in grant-aided schools will be in line with current government guidance and best evidence on healthy eating. Um, the one thing to note is that they improve standards, in particular the recommendation to increase the number of portions of vegetables available every day and reduce the frequency of desserts to twice a week and provide fruit and dairy-based desserts. That is estimated to cost um, you know, an increase in food costs by five to seven pence per meal. And we are um, anecdotally aware that when the first standards were introduced way back in 2007, any increase in the price of school meals can result in a drop in the uptake of school meals uh, for polling pupils. So we've commenced work on drafting a business case to try to secure funding uh, so that we can implement the updated nutritional standards and try to mitigate against the, the cost increases. So as I said earlier, the Minister launched the public consultation on the, the 30th of January and the document itself outlined six proposed updates to be made. Um, again, with regard to increasing the availability of fruit and vegetables, <coughs> higher fibre varieties of food, and reducing the availability of sugar, salt, fat, and processed red meat. And it poses six questions seeking agreement or uh, comments if, the, if there is disagreement. But the document also seeks views, importantly, on uh, you know, whether the updated standards should apply equally to all food and drink provided in schools, and that will include vending machines and tuck shops where those are provided uh, by the school. It will also include independent monitoring and evaluation arrangements. Um, we are recommending these should be established to ensure the, that the actual update standards are being implemented across all the schools. Um, and we are also just asking the question if, as a result of the improved <coughs> nutritional standards, if the cost of a meal was to go up by five pence, you know, what would the, be the response to that? Would parents be prepared to pay that additional amount? <coughs> We have distributed uh, links to the consultation to statutory consultees, education and health key stakeholders and those with an interest in school food. And the EA has notified its food and drink suppliers on behalf of the department. Uh, we have also notified all schools encouraging them to promote participation in the consultation. We are working with EA Youth Services Participation Officer to conduct focused consultations with approximately 120 children and young people who are representative of the skills sectors and geographical spread. 
and we've developed a short two-minute video to highlight the key elements of the consultation and promote participation. We're also planning to commission a focus consultation with parents uh, to get their views um, on the, the, um, the new standards. We've already received around 140 responses, and these have mostly been positive. Um, of course, you know, it will not come as any surprise that the question around potential increase um, is the one that, that most parents do not support. The consultation closes for comment on the 27th of March, and then an analysis of the responses will be produced and published, and final proposals will be um, presented then to them. So we're very happy to take any questions that you might have now in relation to the consultation. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. You can bring Robin Newton in for a question. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome the delegation to, to, to the meeting. Um, uh, I think this is probably going to be, a, again, a valuable uh, piece of work, um, and we wait to see what the outcomes. Can I just, it's a very simple question I have. The, the growing number of school breakfast clubs, are they included within the, the report? Yeah, it's, it's um, the standards apply across the school day. Right. So breakfast clubs will also be included and any food provided in after schools clubs. And they also apply to any vending and touch shops as well, would be the intention. So even though the breakfast clubs aren't actually being provided by the department? This is where we need to see if it has to be mandatory across the board. So that every, every, any, so that every any school... Food Produced in uh, any food uh, within the school is actually meeting the nutritional standards. That will be the. Yeah, but, I mean, my understanding, my experience is that the breakfast clubs are generally provided by a body outside the school, as opposed to who are in a work of charity or supporting the school. If that's the right expression. And I, and I think that's a very important point, and I think we need to make sure that where the breakfast clubs are being, being provided, that schools do adhere to, and, and make sure that whoever they are, they're bringing the, um, the food in, or whoever's providing the food within the school, that they adhere to the standards. Because um, the standards are quite clear in that, you know, there is to be at least two portions of vegetables and a portion of fruit every day. Um, now, that's quite difficult probably, um, well you not get ve vegetables at breakfast, but certainly we would be expecting fruit, uh, and yeah. Judith you'll, you'll be more aware of this than, yeah. than I am, but that's the type of, of foods that we would be expecting at breakfast rather than uh, maybe a, a sausage wrap yeah. or, okay. or whatever, um, and we will be monitoring and evaluating the, the food that is being provided in schools across the school day. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Deputy Chair Carmel. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, as you say, it's, it is timely that the standards are, are looked at. Um, as somebody who used to work in a healthy living centre, we worked very closely with the local schools around food initiatives. So I'm going to just broaden this out and ask, um, just following on from Robin's question, um, is, are, are, will you be looking at food initiatives uh, wider than breakfast clubs, looking at um, uh, school providing uh, school meals over the summer, free breakfast, and making or free fruit breakfast clubs and making recommendations. Um, we we know um, the importance of food in relation to children's lives, their well-being, great <coughs> entertainment. Um, so I, I suppose what I'm asking is. You are looking at nutritional standards and options within schools, but will you be making recommendations further than that? Because I do believe we need to be working, moving towards that. Um, uh, you know, there's obviously we know in terms of children coming in hungry in the morning and all of that, the importance of, that, that that would provide. In relation to, you talk about cost um, and increasing the cost of the meal. There, I attended um, the evidence here and, and here in January last year for the Children's Future Food Inquiry. I'm not sure if you would be that would be part of what you are looking at. And heard very clearly from young people around the table um, uh, that the allowance that they get for free school meal is not enough for them to get a hot, healthy option. 
Per day. So they're looking at possibly a pit, but this is post primary, so a plate of chips and a bottle of water. And they were saying it's not enough. So a couple of points to that. Are you looking at that? As young people's voices included in this, we know in terms of primary schools, our primary schools, the meals are very good. It's when they have post primary and um, parent of two teacher teenagers meant to do different sectoral schools. One was more controlled, the other one fast food all day. Um, so again around around that um, and the controls that's there to ensure that the healthy eating continues with them through their life. But I think the free school meal one, because when, when I looked at the, the, the consultation on that, I just seen the cost in relation to increasing it, but not in terms of supporting families who would be on um, very, very low incomes. And, and then just really is, uh, is there food standards in nurseries? Yeah. yeah. They would be monitored by the health and social care. Right. Um, for early years, it's a document called Nutrition Matters, um, and PHA are aware that when those are revised, the next round of revisions, they will have to align with the standards we're yes. proposing in schools. Sorry, can I just add that in statutory nurseries, the uh, nutritional standards apply, right. and for the preschool program, um, they are recommended because they're being funded by DE and then in, in the voluntary and uh, community sector, uh, they fall under the Department of Health standards that Judith has talked about. Okay, and, and in terms of your other questions, you had asked about the voices of young people, um, and most certainly we want to hear from young people, and that's, you know, we will, we're doing a targeted uh, consultation with um, 120, I think, yes, through the, the youth be over 120. The youth, participation, the youth Participation Office or in the, the EA, so we, we do really want to get a broad um, uh, view from the young people there um, in terms of um, widening out uh, to include things like um, new holidays. Um, I mean, I'm aware that, that you've written to the department about um, holiday hunger. Um, and also to the Department for Communities. So there is something there about you know a, a joint uh, approach and that that would you know is cross cutting and, and yes. should probably um, then be for for the, an executive then to decide ultimately. I'm very happy to take back. Well, that's not specifically within our our remit. I'm very happy to take back your concerns around the the, the holiday hunger, um, the food inquiry. Jill, do you yeah, just uh, just about the the hot healthy. Food and uh, the Food Alliance, um, the free school meal. The value of the free school meal can be used, uh, and there will always, in, in, in excuse me, <coughs> schools should always have at least one choice that uh, can be got within the school meal. It's probably a question of variety and the choices that the children are making. But I would ask you to, to have a wee look at the that children's future and food inquiry, okay. the responses and consultations there, and the sessions that happened here. CINE actually was heavily involved in that. Um, that would be an organisation that you sh should also consult on. They have been doing this work for many years. They do a, a holiday food initiative. Um, and, and you're right, I have wrote to the minister, there was pilots that have been <coughs> in different departments, because it is cross-cutting. Um, and it fed under what we were chatting about this morning. Just a last point in terms of, again, and, and I know this might be not what it's looking at, but in terms of recommendations around the environmental aspect within schools, and we're seeing quite a high proportion of single use plastic. So I think that that should also be done, but maybe I'll go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Next card, uh, Daniel. Yeah, well, th thank you very much for your contribution so far. Uh, as one of the people around this table that has most recently benefited from school meals, I would argue next to Catherine Kelly, probably, in, in, in recent Younger years. Younger than you. <laughs> uh, I have fond memories of uh, the menu, and certainly uh, primary school and uh, post-primary school, and I have to say, uh, school meals, a former principal at the back of the room there, uh, were always very, very good and very nutritious, but I do accept that change is needed given the levels of childhood obesity, but one of the biggest challenges we do face, and Robin has touched on it, uh, uh, and so has Karen, in relation to uh, the Breakfast Club, um, which is uh, vitally important. We have to remember that uh, with the challenges in our society today, there's so many children who go to school hungry in the morning, uh, and the only meal that that child may have in that day, uh, nutritional or otherwise, is within the school. 
Um, and and I, I think we can't underestimate how important it is that we address that issue. And in line with another comment that was made around pricing, so if someone's getting a free school meal, and I know you've made uh, the, 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 uh, made the point that um, there's choice available and they can make their choice in line with the value of their free school ticket. But uh, I think it's important that that child who's benefiting from this free school meal should have the same choice as the child that has uh, whose parent is paying for the meal uh, to ensure that that child uh, is getting a nutritious meal and also is not being treated any way differently from other children who are paying for their meals uh, privately. Uh, and I think that's a key thing, uh, and it's, it's a quite a historic thing actually, it, it isn't anything new, and it does really need to be addressed for the sake of whatever the extra cost uh, will be. Uh, w when I was at school there was a break time prior to lunch. Uh, I don't know, is there still break times at school? Uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, at, at that point there was a lot of children that uh, would have brought in quite a selection of sweets and treats. and. Uh, uh, the same with post primary school, actually, almost smuggling the goods in to sell them to everyone else. Uh, I think that there's issues that Is that a need to be addressed. <laughs> I, was never, I was never caught, in a way, but uh, uh, there certainly is issues that yeah, can be addressed no, in other ways beyond actually being very critical of the meals, which I would always have argued are very good meals provided by schools. <clears throat> and uh, certainly I've never had any complaint about them, uh, as you can tell, uh, over years. So I, I think that there's other issues that need to be addressed here. Obesity, uh, child obesity isn't the fault of a school or, or uh, the school environment or the meals that's been provided to that child. It's happening outside of the school. And yes, it's very important that the school does its part in educating that young person uh, as to uh, good food and well-being and everything else and having a nutritional meal. But the bigger challenges are educating those outside, particularly the home uh, of the child and also the child in itself to ensure it's taken uh, are having nutritional meals. So I've, I've made a rough statement around a lot of things there because Karen has touched on it. But uh, I think the break time issue is where a lot of the sweets and treats are coming in. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of children will hear me saying that and he's pouting on me. But the, the, the bottom line is that's where it really needs to be addressed. I don't think there's an issue per se with the nutrition of the meals at school because I do believe that they've been always quite good. Yes, we can be better, but they've always been quite good. And we have to be. Uh, we have to remember at all times that that's sometimes the only meal that child gets. And I think Karen makes a very uh, valid suggestion in, in, uh, in investigating the potential for meals provided outside of school uh, on holiday time, particularly with the poverty that we face in some communities, uh, and particularly in constituency. But thank you very much. Don't feel you have to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> Can do if you want. <laughs> but I was just going to say that you know, in terms of break times, I mean, there is, we're, we're hoping for a whole school approach mm -hmm. to the nutritional standards. So we would, we would hope that, to solve uh, and you know, that will be um, included. That will include uh, uh, breaks as well. And, and there is. And can I just say the nutritional standards that we're consulting on won't apply to what is brought into the school. So I accept that that is an additional issue that we would have to look at and it's been an issue that's been there for a long time and it's to do with school management and how it is managed and the whole school approach and this is where it looks at the education and in the curriculum as well as what's provided and healthy breaks policies and healthy breakfasts as well. Okay. All right, Daniel. Uh, Robbie Butler. Yeah, um, this will not be as entertaining as Daniel's, I don't think. <laughs> although, although, I mean, we share very similar values, but Karen and, and Daniel myself and, and Robin, so far in terms of what our passions would be. You know, I was a guy who, who grew up in free school dinners and absolutely adored them. Um, and I think that I was disappointed actually to hear, and it's not a criticism to, to hear that you're uh, thinking of taking away uh, desserts the two a week. <laughs> I, I really do, genuinely, because no. jam roly poly and custard and, and you know, there, there are things I didn't get at home. And that's, the, that's right. the truth of it. And, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a point that I want to make about that. I'm looking at the this, this stats in and around free meals. <laughs> and for the, the children who qualify for free meals, you have an 80% uptake. Yeah. For the, for, but in a 59.3% uptake of, of meals. So at the moment, the people who get school meals predominantly are for those from socially deprived backgrounds. Huh. Um, and, and I think that's really important that we don't um, 
use uh, a stick to, 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 to thresh out something else. A, a different problem, a problem that we have with regard perhaps to obesity and, and unhealthy lifestyles, that we actually take away some of the, the good that school meals do. And the, and, and, and the reason being, and Karen's alluded to it in the, in the holiday poverty, but there's food poverty. So yeah. not in, in, the, in the holiday times, it is perhaps the single most important meal that some children, even if it's a small amount of children, will get. And I, I mean, I remember when I was a butcher years ago, watching kids go to school, maybe a Mars bar and a tin of mm -hmm. Coke, and it broke my heart to see it, um, and knowing that they actually, that was, their, that was their breakfast and perhaps a meal later on. And during the day, it's really important that they get literally the, the, the potatoes, the, the, the veg and the, and, and, and the meat, and jam, roly-poly and custard. But th there's a wee bit of a, I don't know if it still exists, uh, there was a stigma attached to free meals. Back in the day, it was one of the most humiliating things to, to, to go on, on a day. I um, just want to see how you're maybe looking at how you, how you look after that a cohort of children. Um, and, um, yeah, there's another question in there. It might come to me if you can answer that one. OK, well, okay. In, in terms of uh, the stigma, um, I think there was some recent research... Um, I I'll see if I can put my finger on it here, but it didn't... The stigma didn't seem to be um, from the children's point of view, possibly maybe more from... Maybe more the teachers felt it or the, the parents felt it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real challenge here for us to make the school meals, um, you know, as one of our other colleagues said, um, make it so that nobody is treated any differently, so the choice is there, the same choice for, for everybody. There's also something around the... Um, can, I, can I ask you a quick question? Is anybody currently treated any differently? No, not to my knowledge. Used to be. Right. That it used to be because it, we, we couldn't get... That really, there was, there was it's the a, two... It's, it's, a, it's a payment system, isn't yeah. it, how it works? Yeah. Um, and I think the Education Authority have looked at... Um, some schools would use, like my son, it was the, the fingerprint or the yeah. thumb. Yeah. Um, but still in some schools there's a ticket in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think ticket. that's where the stigma comes right. from. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we should be cash. working urgently to there being no difference. You, yeah. you, they, there uh, should be no stigma, no difference in how people are treated, yeah. They are looking at trying to roll out one system. Um, so we would probably need an update on that. Update on that, OK. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, well, can, can you... I mean, people have... I, mean, I, don't, I used school dinners when I was there as well. I, Admittedly, not as much as recently as Tim Cross and I do. It but I'm not aware of, of, in my involvement in education, that children on free school dinners are treated differently to those who pay. Can you clarify that? Well, no, it just you mean, different, uh, pay, systems. different payment no, methods. Yeah. 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 Yes, but I'm talking about the child getting the meal. There's no difference in the meals no, that are presented. Oh, the meal, no. No, no, no. no the no, payment no. methods, sometimes no. it seems, yeah. yeah. It's just that there will be the healthy option at the value that they get for their free school meal will always be available for them uh, to take. And that will be a balanced meal, a healthy meal. Um, but they may prefer what their friends are taking, and that's the issue. That's but well, if yeah. they take the free, the free school meal, the fixed meal, meal of the day, it will be healthily balanced. Yeah. OK, ca let Karen come in, and then I'll let you come in briefly, yeah. Robin. Yeah. Go ahead. There's no difference in primary school. Yeah. The dinner comes in and, and everybody gets it. It's post primary. So what that Pierre was saying at the inquiry was say on free school meals you get two pound sixty, is it? You get two eighty in post primary. So what what she was saying is she wanted a healthier option, um, uh, but she couldn't by the time she bought a bottle of water and mm -hmm. possibly that's what she could afford on the two pound eighty. If a parent is paying some no, I had a boy, and some days I got eight or five. Or I was like, so that was maybe the difference as as in post primary, but definitely there's no difference in in primary. Well, all I would say there should always be free, uh, fresh drinking water available. No one should be ha having to buy a bottle of water. Yeah, Robbie, briefly, yeah, and, and that okay. just that does reminds me of the <coughs> second question. Then, with regard to um, the department's ability to uh, maintain the standards across every single sector. Do you have it? So, regardless of not just geography, but in terms of the sectors that um, are, are under yeah, that, that's one of the things as part of the consultation is about the monitoring and the evaluation. Because there's no point in putting out these standards if we're not going to ensure that, that, that they're being adhered to. It's not all about you know inspection and under the big stick. There's a lot of support uh, that will be required, uh, you know, in, in some schools as well. Uh, and that's what we are, it would be like a more collaborative approach in working with the, the schools to make sure that 
you know, the, the, the children know now, you're very well aware of the, the health impacts of, of many things. So in educating them, they do know that they, what the healthy choices should be. And it is trying to keep that momentum going and work with them and work with the schools and just ensure that that they can, um, I don't know if it's a case of marking them out as a, a healthy school or something, but, you know, awards are usually quite um, welcome, I suspect, you know, and if you are designated as a, a healthy school, then that would be a, um, a good bonus. But I think, the, I think it is about working together, you know, with the, um, our inspectorate, our, our ATI, and we've had conversations already with them about how we can actually move you know, forward into a more holistic approach to the whole health and wellbeing and, and the monitoring and evaluation of that, of which the nutritional standards would be included. Just to say that simply to change the standards without having a supporting framework will really not get the result <coughs> that we want, and that's why we will, are prepared to and have already started working on um, new menus and new dishes that uh, are appealing to, to children and hopefully to maintain the uptake. And alongside then we need to make it mandatory in all schools so that there is no difference. And as Margaret Rose says, make sure that we have somebody <coughs> uh, checking. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I be brief? I think it's all been covered. but. Did I pick you up right and you say that this was introduced in 2007? The no. original ones were introduced. And this is the first yes. review since then? They have been reviewed. Well, well this, is, this is the sorry. first formal review. They, we sit on a group um, the, and we have had a food and schools coordinator who constantly looks at uh, any new advice that comes out and will reassure us that we are broadly in keeping with that. However, the complete change of the, the Eat Well Guide in, in some respects, we're probably not doing as well as we should. But we still are providing within guidance. Yeah, but I like the idea of introducing new food, like <coughs> pastures, rice, and pulses, etc., etc. Think and water freely available. A massive boost in any school. I arrived at school a long time ago, probably longer than most of us. Uh, Exception of Robin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Robin. Uh, you only get a veil of water at big time. He's just done. So that's a big plus. The other thing I wanted to touch base with, about was uh, external food sources. Mm -hmm. Where pupils at break time can leave the school premises because of where it's situated, mm -hmm. go down the town and buy a meal. What is there in place to educate pupils through the school that when they go down, not be heading to the chip shop? Come on down with a big ham and cheese. Belfast pub. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Crisps in it. Well, healthy eating is part of the curriculum. Yeah. And um, it's uh, throughout the, from foundation to key stage four and all about food and how it's grown and the benefits of health associated with it. Uh, also year eight to ten. Uh, it's compulsory that all pupils in all schools have um, has, uh, home economics, which will teach them the benefits of nutrition and help them develop skills to uh, make healthy meals and identify healthy meals. So there's that within the curriculum, um, and then it's really a matter of uh, a whole school approach and uh, having healthy options available and not having unhealthy options available to buy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Justin? Hey folks, thank you very much for your presentation of your answers so far. There's, an, there's a quote from an old sports coach of mine just ringing through my mind right now. It's, uh, you can't out-train a bad diet. Um, and in terms of that, how much how, how much does a bad diet impact on a child's education? Uh, I, I relate that specifically to sugar. Um, and in the draft consultation, or the consultation, you, you've noted regularly consuming foods and drinks high in sugar increases a child's risk of obesity and tooth decay. Children's intake of free sugars currently exceed the recommendation of no more than 5% of total energy from free sugars. To what extent does, do they exceed? Recommendation. Uh, just if I have that figure. Uh, we took all our evidence on 
diet in the population from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey for Northern Ireland, so that's where those figures have been picked up. Um, I don't think we have the specific figure, but that should be able to get that from the survey, um, to translate that into actual grams per day. Um, roughly, a uh, four to six year old child would be about 19 grams. So if you were looking at your total sugar consumption or you were analysing a menu, for example. 19 is the acceptable threshold? An absolute maximum. maximum so four to six, seven to 10, you're up to 24 grams. Uh, 11 plus is 30 grams, but that's including all adults. So really the recommendation would be reducing where you can additional free sugars. Okay, I'm just, um, I read recently a major European study following the health and habits of nearly half a million people. It was published in the Journal of American Medical Association. Basically, it says drink soda, die younger. Um, drink sugary drinks, die younger. Um, to what extent have you influenced the you old know, schools selling sugary drinks in talk shops or providing sugary drinks in their school meals? Well, um, in terms of the standards, um, with, with the free sugar content, we looked at what are the main contributors of sugar in the school menu at the moment, and that really was um, desserts and some drinks. So um, that's why we have reduced desserts to twice a week. For drinks, we have um, engaged with the market to see what's available. We've looked to references like the Public Health England sugar reduction targets as well and linked with oral health um, colleagues and other health professionals. So we have um, put limitations in a very specific um, spec for the drinks that are included in school meals at the moment. Um, we've been guided by the Eat Well Guide, so any fruit juice that is available should have a maximum portion of 150 mils. So that's been added in. Um, we're looking at combination drinks, which are a combination of fruit juice and water. They will have, again, a maximum cap of 150 mils and a maximum portion size. So they're, um, that's in terms of the, the standards. In terms Just of to, uh, the current standards don't allow yes. very sugary drinks anyway. The drinks that are coming in are either being brought in by the pupils or, <clears throat> as is increasing, uh, are being provided by the school because we can't make it mandatory yet. Um, for schools, that any food they provide outside the, the school meal service, um, we can't cover that just yet, and that's where we need, that's part of our consultation to address. Okay, and what, what, to what extent do you know of the impact on the children's ability to be, to be taught after, sh with sugar spikes from what they're taking in? Well, we, we do know from the um, OECD survey way back in 13-14, uh, was it, that it affects children's attainment level by about 13%. So that's fairly significant now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's something that should be considered as mandatory in terms of what the school provides? Um, Regardless of who provides it. Yeah. yeah. I know. I, so, I, I requested this briefing today because I'm really passionate about this. I, I, as you can see, the other members are. Um, I think it's something we need to go into in more detail. How do we, uh, what, how do you measure compliance? So you, mm. Justin's questions are extremely perceptive there in terms of the detail of a nutritional intake. I'm really grateful for yeah. the detail of your response, Judith, extremely helpful. Um, uh, what, what is the, how are the nutritional standards monitored and improved? Well, at, the, at the minute? We, we previously yeah. had two uh, um, nutritional nutritionists who worked with our um, uh, ETI, uh, Education and Training Inspectorate, uh, and I mean, obviously they had the, the experience and the background and the, the professional expertise to see what the, the, the schools were actually providing. There is something around the menu planning um, yes. and ensuring that the, and, and Judith, you'll talk more about the menu planning. Uh, but assuring that the menus that are provided and the training that is provided as well then throughout the summer to the catering staff, that that will um, you know, make sure that they are actually up to speed with the type of menus and the, the type of foods to, to put together mm -hmm. to make sure that the children are getting the, the balanced nutritional uh, the diet. And also at procurement, um, Judith works very hard uh, with the contracts to make sure that they, the food that's coming in will be compliant. So on the basis that if the food that's coming in to make the school meals is compliant, then 
your man and your menu planning, it will make everything compliant with it. So what? Okay, not hundred percent clear on that to be honest. Um, but what what what's your assessment of current compliance levels then? In terms of the Education Authority, there is a monitoring and auditing system in place and a lot of the geographical offices within EA have gone down the route of standardised menus, so it means less checking. So um, for myself, a lot I would pick up samples of menus or if there were changes, they would come to me and I would check those for compliance. And with the introduction of more standardised menus, it's much easier to see that there is compliance. Um, with ETI, it would be beneficial that your, your menu meets your servery. You could have a beautiful menu that looks great, but um, you do need to see what's happening in the school as well to see that it is complying. So does, does ETI monitor? The... No, not at, not at this stage. Um, there, there was two um, nutritional... Um, Nutritional Associates posts. Associates haven't been in post since 2011, and it's been self-monitoring uh, since that. So the EA reports termally uh, to the department uh, and they carry out inspections themselves within their uh, provision and um, there's, uh, it, while it's not independent as such, there are levels of management that check in the various areas. So we, so we the ETI <coughs> monitors and approves what education we give our children and people in our schools? But not what food. Not specifically That's in the food at the moment, but they will, you know, they will make recommendations. And I think the the last ETI report, um, you know, the, the chief inspector did comment on the um, the, the level they of. Did, um, they did on comment the on the problem with obesity, uh, and that there should be something uh, taken forward, yeah. a, a joint, you know, collaborative approach to to addressing it. But when they inspect in a school, it's my understanding that uh, they don't inspect the canteen at all. And I think that is something that the um, consultation is, is also very keen to make sure that we, at the end of the consultation, when we put the proposals forward again, that we have um, a monitoring and evaluation process that is robust. Um, because these, you know, that, that's the whole point of getting the nutritional standards out there is to make sure that the schools are actually definitely think that's something to, to look at. You, so in, in lieu of a monitoring improvement mechanism, it's really to try and offer guidance, ideas, um, menus, as, as you've said. The, so the department previously funded a, a catering advisor, five nutritional standards coordinators in the Educational Library Boards and two nutritional associate posts in the Education and Training Inspectorate. What the current provision now appears to be a joint funded post with health for a regional food in schools coordinator and then are there trust regional food in schools coordinators like yourself Judith no, no. what what's the current level of provision then for education y yeah it would be myself okay yeah, yeah. And the, are you with the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, or yes, you're regional? I'm jointly funded by Department of Education and Public Health Agency. That funding goes to Belfast Trust, and I'm also housed in EA. So I have a multi-partnership management group, so I work across all the sectors, which works very well. Okay. So in terms of a, a food and schools coordinator, compared to what was previously in post of cater, catering advisor, nutritional standards coordinators, that has been reduced to one post, effectively. Is that a fair understanding? I think, well, 2007 was the initial introduction of any standards, so we were going really from, you know, having nothing in place to very drastic measures. So that was really for the initial implementation. And I think with ETI inspecting it over the years, it was fine. It, yeah. was, it was normal <coughs> practice by then. Um, and there are the, systems in place, say, that with framework monitoring. was absolutely necessary at the time because of the baseline that the, the, the changes were coming from. Um, and uh, the inspectors were there from 2007 during that time, and they were looking at barriers to implementation and things that could be helped to get that. There was a whole training exercise, equipment exercise, uh, resources exercise. And in terms of that, 
we aren't in as big a change now. We are having changes, but a lot of that has been established. Um, and yes, the, the support network has reduced. Okay. And the Northern Ireland Audit Office reported in March 2011, promoting good nutrition through healthy school meals. One of the recommendations was for more effective monitoring of compliance with nutritional standards, for example, through unannounced school visits and the removal of unhealthy foods from tuck shops and vending machines. What progress has been made on that recommendation? Well, you know, the, the, we accept, I think, that the monitoring hasn't been as uh, robust as it should have been. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, as part of this consultation, as part of introducing the new standards, that we do want to see a much more robust monitoring. Um, you know, it, I, I have to you know, be absolutely honest. Resources was a big issue. Money was an issue during that period of time, and, and you know, budgets have been squeezed, um, and that you know has clearly had an impact on some of the things that we had hoped would have been well embedded at this point. Um, but I think now is the time where we can. Um, you get back to the, the point where we have very clear evidence of how schools are actually um, complying with the, the standards and indeed, um, you know, as part of their whole education, or their, their whole curriculum uh, piece around healthy food, that, that we can see the benefits of that in the longer term. Um, so, you know, we, we would accept that the, that, that has not been as, it, as we would have liked it to have been. Um, but you know, I think that a lot of that is down to the squeeze that we're on budgets. And, and okay. just to say that the unannounced inspections are much broader, it's much broader as you, than uh, nutritional standards. Uh, I don't believe they happen in any sphere for the ETI. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine um, Kelly. Um, thank you for your presentations. And Chair, can I take this opportunity to thank Margaret Rose for all the work that she put into the Children and Young People's Strategy? especially um, now that you've moved, moved posts. Thank you. um, my question is around allergies, um, and we're seeing an increasing amount of young people um, with allergies. Um, what steps are the, or do the department um, take um, to ensure that children with the likes of nut allergies or gluten intolerances have their needs met um, with, at this time, um, and also is that within the consultation? Um, the current standards allow for provision for um, medical needs and disabilities, including allergies, religious and cultural needs. Any special diets uh, are, are, um, can be accommodated. Uh, the process around which that happens uh, the EA has recently, the last year, sent out guidance that it should be a whole school approach and not driven just by the catering side. Catering has a big impact, obviously, but it's very important that um, the whole school and the whole school day is um, accommodated within allergies. Judith has a, a very good understanding and, and uh, and deals with that on the day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So maybe Judith has something to say. Yeah, um, so the Education Authority would cater for many diets, not just allergies, um, very regularly. Um, but you're right, we are actually seeing an increase in the number of allergies we're having to cater for um, over the last few years, and particularly the complexity and severity of some of the allergies. So this was raised as an issue, and... Um, over the last couple of years, we realised that we needed some kind of guidance to give to schools. Um, so that the guidance that was issued last year really outlines the roles and responsibilities of everybody involved. So not just catering, it's down to the school and the, the parent and the pupil as well about informing of what their needs are. So it's very much about safeguarding children, that's the absolute. Um, within that guidance, it say breaks down what you're responsible for, those individual parties. But it's also providing best practice in terms of application forms, medical forms, so asking for the detail in what is required. And that guidance asks for medical evidence from a GP, a dietitian, or a consultant. So we know that it's coming from a reputable source and has that detail required. Um, the best practice is that it is if any any diet at all, or you know, a medical condition or allergy, that there would be a meeting take place between the parent, the catering and the school. 
um, there is a, a checklist, almost best practice, what you should cover in that meeting. That is then, um, there's an outcome form, so you're describing what has been discussed and what has been agreed going forward. And there's also a template for a risk assessment for the school to complete. So um, putting the controls in place to avoid any risk to that child. Um, with allergen, there is allergen management practices within catering, and that comes under a HACCP food safety document. Um, so the risk assessments could be included in that. And um, any food business operator would be um, their risk management sorry, their allergen management risk assessments would be included in any inspections from environmental health. So um, your five-star ratings for food hygiene, if you, um, allergen management would be included in that. So um, I think the EA have a 95% for a five-star rating. So it does show um, confidence in allergen management at the moment. Thank you. Okay, okay. Justin McLaughlin. Thanks, Trey. Just a quick one. In terms of the different components of education and of a young person's development, uh, the academic piece, the physical, the safe um, um, environment, the lifestyle, which obviously um, nutrition plays an important part of, and mental health and um, well-being. Do you feel that each element has been sort of compartmentalised and separated and put into silos where there's not a joined up approach and then from that perspective do you feel undervalued? Well, I, th I think um, you know we what we are trying to do is absolutely recognise all of these parts you know they're, they're all part of the one whole um, and what we were trying or, or what we're hoping for in our monitoring and evaluation is that we have more of a holistic approach to the child around physical education, around nutritional standards, around the health and well-being generally. And that is what we would try to um, you know, monitor and, re and report on. Um, and I, I didn't quite catch the last part of your question. You feel, in terms of the importance of the role you ladies are playing, do you feel undervalued in terms of how that impacts the, children, the children's education and their overall development because of the importance of the, the well, it's not task you face? It wouldn't be a case of us, you know, we're not feeling undervalued in any way, what we're trying just to... You're not, getting, you're not getting sufficient resource to be able to fulfil your roles completely, so that, for that, that's, that's how I, I, I should have been able to question. But the, the, there's always the, 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 um, the difficulty in trying to get resources for each uh, particular piece of work, there's no doubt about that, but, you know, I think if we, we do it more holistically, if we do it more with other areas of work, there's a better chance then of getting the resources then into that particular uh, aspect. But I do think it's important that we do have, a, you know, the whole the physical, um, the, the nutritionists and the, the health and well-being together. And, and you know, when, it, when they're working together as a whole, it's easier possibly to put through the bid for the funding that you would require for that. The more joined up approach should be better. Thank you. Can I ask one further question? It's my understanding that the department previously provided additional funding so as to ensure that the food uh, content of school meals was a, a minimum numerical value. Is that right? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. And it was previously a minimum of 50p in nursery, primary and special schools and a minimum of 60p in post-primary schools? What what is the the current minimum food content value of school meal? Well, um, that still holds, but the, the the latest reports are that in post primary it's seventy three p food costs, and in primary it's sixty one. Okay. That obviously fluctuates, but it's always generally around an average of sixty five p food costs. That that it seems to me as a untrained uh, observer in this specific uh, area of expertise to be an extremely low uh, value per meal is that is that am i wrong is that an adequate value for a nutritional um, meal um well yes we think it is and okay. because it has moved up and um, there's been a lot of work done uh, the ea is constantly trying to get efficiencies obviously to, in their contracts and stuff to, to make it all more um, value for money. But uh, a lot of a school meal is labour costs 
and then you have your other costs as well associated with so the food costs of a school meal are on average 65p okay okay thank you very much indeed for your your presentation today i realize the consultation has just commenced mm -hmm. um so it'd be great if y if you'd return to the committee to brief us on the outcome of the consultation mm -hmm. and i think at that stage we may be able to make a, a submission as a, a committee to to the work but um, as members have suggested we highly value this area of provision in our education system Absolutely. and the work that you guys are doing so thank you very much in, in, indeed and we look forward to hearing okay, from you thank again you. thank you Okay, members, so I'll just ask the clerk to summarise on any actions we need to take further to that briefing. Uh, so, Chairperson, if I've understood correctly, the, I think the committee would like to write to the department, maybe seeking an update on its response to the holiday hunger issue and also the issue that the Deputy Chair mentioned, the school's future, fu future food inquiry. Um, additionally, then, Chairperson, I think members would probably like to write to the Education Authority um, seeking just further information <coughs> on the, uh, the, the sugar levels that Mr McNulty uh, mentioned and the, the extent to which they're currently being exceeded, and also um, seeking, seeking further information on how the Authority is uh, seeking to mitigate the stigma uh, around um, free school meals and what they're doing around different payment methods. Um, additionally, members, we didn't say this, but are you interested in getting an update um, on the extent to which the Education Authority is taking action to improve uptake of free school meals? It used to be that the Western Education and Library Board was really good at this and there was a higher level of uptake because they actually targeted parents who were entitled to the, the relevant benefits and this then led to a much greater uptake in, in the west of Northern Ireland than elsewhere. So, members interested just to yeah, see where they are with that. Agreed. Yeah. And then the idea, as the Chair has already indicated... Sorry. Just in terms of sugar piece, can we ask also how it's been monitored and managed in schools? Okay, yes. Uh, I think as the Chair then had indicated, um, what the Committee would do is ask the Department nicely if they will summarise responses to the Committee, come back and say um, what the... Um, what the general direction of travel is likely to be, and then informed by all those responses, the committee could then make its response. Um, but they'll ask us to do that really quickly, and then the, the minister will, will make his decision on the, on the way forward, if that's acceptable, chairperson yep. and members. Okay. Agreed. Members agreed? Good. Yeah. Yes, sir, chair. Uh, yep. By and large, you know, I know the questions are, but this is a sound piece Absolutely. of work mm. to, to be done. Mm. There's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic building block for the future of, of, of in all aspects of life, from primary, from nurture school right through to, and it's a signed piece of work. Okay, members agreed. Okay, I move to agenda item seven then, correspondence, and ask the clerk to speak to our correspondence items. Good chairperson, uh, we have a summary note of correspondence at uh, page 181. I just ask if members are content to follow the suggested approach with the exception of the following. Um, so yeah, we're at page 181. So we've got, sorry, item 7.4, which is page 188. This is correspondence from the Committee for Health, forwarding correspondence from an individual regarding um, the inclusion of menstrual well-being in the education curriculum. So we ask chairperson if members are content uh, for the clerk to write to the department asking if it does indeed plan to introduce menstrual well-being into the education curriculum, which may be the case in some other jurisdictions. Yeah, members content, content yeah. to ask the question. Yeah, content, yeah. agreed. Right, okay, then, so moving on then to uh, item 7.6, which is page 192. It's Farmers for Action. They've uh, specifically mentioned the issue of uh, the closure of rural schools. Um, Chairperson, are members content if um, they invite the group to an informal meeting, so that's on Tuesday lunchtime in the not too distant future? Agreed. 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 Uh, then at page 193, correspondence from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Um, I'd be content for the clerk to just write back to the Human Rights Commission and seek details of the education-related issues that they wish to discuss, because it's quite a general letter. Um, it doesn't 
uh, particularly refer to education to see if there's something something on their minds. Yep, agreed. 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 Uh, then we get to um, right um, item seven point eight. Um, which is the department's response on parental engagement in children's education. So the committee committee is to meet informally with parenting and I on this issue uh, shortly. To, could I ask, uh, Chairperson, if the committee are content to invite parent kind as well to the same uh, informal event? So we're yeah. based on the emotional health and well-being of something to talk to parenting and I about. Yeah. And parent Agreed. kind, I think we're more the, the other. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. And then... Um, Finally, uh, just to be sure, there's a letter from the Construction Employers Association um, seeking a meeting with the committee chair. I'm just content to maybe slightly decline that one. Is it, it just looks like a it's sort of general, I think it's written to all of the um, committee chairs. I'm not aware of any Construction Employers Federation issues in education, maybe wrong, but um, are you content for me to do that? I'm, I'm uh, fish in a bit more detail, maybe rather than okay. just closing okay. it down. Right right back. Yep. Yep. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'd be more yeah, specific. I'm, yeah, on, on the side of specific issues, I yeah. am in principle content to meet. Um, yeah, I'd be um, reluctant to decline too many requests, so perhaps we can get a bit more detail on that. Members content with yeah. that? Yeah. I think also in terms of the uh, construction industry, they, they feel that there is uh, going to be a construction boom forthcoming and they need to have the people resource yeah. educationally ways to be able to, to meet that boom. So I think it's worth exploring further, certainly. Yeah. No problem. Okay. We'll do that. That's, okay. all. That's all for our correspondence. Unless members have anything else they wish to raise. Nope. Okay. Members content? Content. Okay. Any other business members? No. Okay, then we move into private session um, for our briefing from Assembly Research and Information Service with regards to educational issues. Okay, clerk, content. Mr. Chairperson, we just will wait till the uh, push the button, and we're yep. content to move into closed session. Did you yep. say? Yeah. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.